When I was 17, I worked construction for a small company outside of Kansas City. We did multiple jobs all over the city, from restaurants to stores. On this particular job, we got a contact to remodel a church. We went and gave bids and everything went well, and we ended up actually securing the job. The first day, the day that we arrived, nothing really was out of the ordinary. It was a typical Monday and we unloaded all of the tools and took measurements and just sort of looked around and really admired the beauty of the place, I guess. We took all measurements and got lists of materials needed and we just called it a day. The second day, we showed up and waited for our materials to be delivered and while we waited, we got to tearing down some of the old rotten wood and broken flooring. Maybe when we were about... I don't know, half an hour to an hour into this, we heard walking in the back room. We thought it was the delivery guy coming in the back door, but when we went out to check, nothing was there and the door was locked. We didn't think much of it and just shrugged it off and soon enough the materials arrived and we started finishing up removal and we called it a day. On the third day, we show up and our supplies are absolutely in disarray. We call the owner and we ask if anyone has been there and he informs us that the church is closed for the week for the construction. This kind of freaks us out a bit but we just slap it all back together and we go back to work. But the entire day when anyone would make a noise or remove something or add anything to the church we would hear a bang behind the pulpit we investigated it like 10 times, but there was nothing there, and it never would repeat or do anything unless we were actively working on the church. It starts to get dark, and we both leave a little early that day, and we didn't enjoy that day at all. On the fourth day, I'll be honest and say that I'm already not wanting to go, but of course we have to. We show up at like 2 or 3 p.m. and start going about it. And sure as heck, as soon as we begin, it's right back and even louder this time. I didn't even want to work anymore. We got so annoyed that we physically moved the podium to the back of the church in the end. The banging, it doesn't stop though. It doesn't stop coming from the same place, right under where it was. We just try to ignore it and we keep working. But again, I refuse to stay after dark and... We do what we can and we leave. Now, on the last day, we show up and first thing I clearly see is the podium. It's back where it started and our supplies were messed up even more than last time. I am at this point completely over the whole job and I clean up our supplies and tell my buddy to move the podium again and let's just finish this. He moves it and we start working. This time though... There's absolutely no banging, which was wonderful. This goes on for half an hour to an hour and then, all of a sudden, we hear loud running footsteps in the back. We both go and check. We were scared and there is absolutely nothing there. Like, there's not even a thing in the room. This happens about maybe five or six times in the span of a few hours Finally, though, we both agree that it's time to just leave. We start packing our tools and that was when we hear the most terrifying scream from what I guess was a girl and running in the back again, but inhumanly fast. And that was the last straw. We ran outside as fast as we could. We left the tools and had the owner leave them outside and we picked them up later. I never went into that place again and all I can say is that there is something horribly wrong with that church. I never got paid for that job either because we didn't finish it but to be honest I didn't care. So I once babysat my two cousins, brother and sister, along with my little brother at their house one summer. I was downstairs on the computer in the main room when the brother and sister just started fighting. 
It all began because the brother was snooping on his sister's phone calls with their mum or something, my aunt, using the other house phone or whatever. He quickly ran upstairs though and locked himself in the master bedroom using one of those old-fashioned metal locks to get away from her. As I ran upstairs to stop him from getting a beat down, the sister SWAT team kicked the door open, breaking the latch and just about got to him until I split them up and I told her to go to her room next door and dragged him downstairs to sit with me and my brother while I went back on the computer. All of a sudden though, I heard a similar kick to a door and thought, what the heck is she doing up there? The boys looked just as confused because it was such a loud noise and we thought maybe she was still tripping out. So right away I ran to the bottom of the stairs to tell her to calm down. But she already was there at the top of the stairs yelling, tell RJ to leave me alone, leave my door alone. And my heart instantly dropped when I told her no one came up there. She turned her back to the wall and slid to the floor screaming in horror. I ran up there shaking and brought her down slowly, trying to process how the heck that sound was made when she was the only one upstairs. Finally, when we got down, I told the boys to get outside and we all sat on the front steps waiting for our grandmother to show up. She investigated the house and tried to say that it was just a truck passing by, but we all knew deep down that there was no way that it was a truck. A few years later, when they moved out, my cousin's dad finally fessed up that the previous owner, who was an old man, had actually fallen down those stairs, broke his neck, and laid there for a week before anybody found him. To this day, I think my cousin ticked him right off for breaking his bedroom lock and did the same right back to her. So I used to work at my ex-father-in-law's law practice. I was in my early 20s and I worked there for years at this point. The office, it was one of those old historical three-story buildings that is over like a hundred years old. My co-workers and I, we witnessed all kinds of weird stuff there too. Sometimes we would see it together, sometimes separately and sometimes we'd find evidence of strange stuff too. One time during everybody's lunch break, I decided to stay and work. The kitchen microwave door kept opening though. I would hear it, get up, close it, and sit back down. This happened three different times within the hour as well. Another time, my ex-sister-in-law and her two kids were visiting. They were just hanging out in the waiting area and I was in the room talking to them. But suddenly, the kitchen light in the next room came on and at the same time, two wall photos in the waiting room fell to the ground. That was pretty insane. Also, there was this sort of heavy old school timestamp machine that was in the kitchen and we would find it on the ground all the time. The thing though was on the counter, sitting against the wall and it was super heavy. We eventually moved it to one of my co-workers office and it would fall on the floor in there too. Sometimes we would hear it happen even and there it would be on the floor with no explanation for how the heck it even got there. We have also heard upstairs footsteps, doors opening and closing regularly when nobody was upstairs. My ex-husband worked there too and he said that he never experienced anything like that and thought that it was all in our heads. But he became a believer one evening when he stayed at work after hours. He was alone in his office and a huge framed painting that sat above the old fireplace, the mantle, just crashed onto the floor, made a huge mess too. It honestly never felt malicious, I guess. We just sort of always laughed it off and said the ghost was up to its regular hijinks and I don't even know what it was to be honest. I never believed in ghosts, but I will tell you that there is definitely something in that office that I cannot explain. It was a typical Tuesday night, the kind where the darkness outside crept into the corners of the room, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. 
I was nestled on the couch, binge watching my favorite TV series, oblivious to the horrors lurking just beyond my front door. The sound came faintly at first, a subtle creaking that I brushed off as the house settling, but then it grew louder, more pronounced, like the slow deliberate steps of someone trying to be stealthy perhaps. My heart quickened its pace as a chill raced down my spine, the air thickening with an undeniable sense of sudden dread. I glanced around, searching for reassurance in the familiar surroundings of my living room, but the silence that followed was honestly deafening, punctuated only by the pounding of my heartbeat in my ears. I convinced myself that it was just my imagination running wild, that there was nothing to fear, but then... I heard it, the unmistakable click of the front door being unlocked. Panic surged through me as I leapt to my feet, my mind racing with adrenaline-fueled thoughts. Without hesitation, I crept toward the doorway, my senses on high alert as I strained to hear any sign of movement on the other side. And then I saw him, a shadowy figure looming in the doorway, his features obscured by the darkness. Fear gripped me like a vice as I stumbled backward, my voice caught in my throat. What do you want? I managed to choke out, my words trembling with fear. But he said nothing, his silence more chilling than any words could ever be really. Instead, he advanced towards me, his movements slow and deliberate, like a predator closing in on its prey. I backed away, my mind racing with desperate pleas for escape, but there was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the terror that had invaded my home. With each step he took, the room seemed to shrink around me, closing in until there was nowhere left to go, and then, in an instant, he was upon me, a dark, menacing presence that enveloped me in its suffocating embrace. I fought back with all the strength that I could muster, but it was no use. His grip was ironclad, his intentions clear as he bore down on me with a ferocity that sent shivers down my spine as I fought. I screamed for help, but my cries fell on deaf ears as the darkness just seemed to swallow me. And then, just as suddenly as it had all began, it was over. The intruder got up, ran, and vanished into the night, leaving me battered and bruised in his wake. As I lay there, trembling and broken, I knew that I would never be the same after that. The horror of that night haunts me and will forever, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurks just beyond the safety of our own front doors. And although the intruder may have escaped into the night, the scars that he left behind, well, they'll never fade away. This happened a while ago, back in late July, early August of 2022, at around maybe 9 o'clock at night. I think maybe even slightly earlier than that. Anyway, me and my friend, we decided to take photos in the forest that evening. Yeah, I know, it's a bit of a dumb idea, but everything was going fine. Of course, slightly scary due to the dark, but all was well. We were two girls in the forest and it's twilight, which is risky, I know, but at around 9.40, my friend's mum calls her saying that we should go back to her place because it's getting late. This was understandable, so we ended up heading back to her place. I ask her, can we take the shortcut out of the forest? And she says, all right to this. And that was our biggest mistake. While going through the shortcut... I see some guy in front of us. I then notice that he's holding an axe in one hand and was wearing a horse mask. He was quite tall, being well over six foot, and he was slowly coming towards us. I suddenly take my friend's hand, because, well, I'm thinking that we're about to die, and tell her, do not go there, there's a dude wearing a horse mask up there, but she ignores me, continues walking towards him slowly. With no emotion, I just take her hand and just force her to run to the longer exit from the forest. 
While running, I'm literally not hearing anything she's saying to me because I'm in a complete panic. While running, I see a random woman walking with two average-sized dogs. Yes, I know I'm dumb for not warning her about the horse dude, but I was in a panic, like I said. And finally, we escape the forest and are about to go to her place. While walking to her place, she's asking me a bunch of questions like, what was that stuff back there? And she also mentions hearing that the guy was running after us. So yeah, we were petrified and we go to her place and we just talk about what happened. And to be honest, I genuinely wish that that was the end of it, but it wasn't. You see, in October of 2022, I was casually browsing Latvian news and see some articles about a dead person in the same forest that me and my friend were in. So my question is, did we escape a murder via an axe dude wearing a, a horse mask? I don't know if I should report this or what, but I just need some guidance. I'll try to keep it brief. So, Saturday night, my boyfriend and I were heading home after a drinkless night out. I was driving and pulled up to a red light and told him keep an eye out for the green light for me because I wanted to check my phone. Now, I always pull up on the white line. I hate when people stop short of it. I was fully aware and not sleepy at all when I said this, and for some additional context, I was going down a slight hill as well. I was up the hill from the light, so I would have had to have rolled backwards up the hill with my car in drive. I also have the auto parking brakes on when my car comes to a complete stop. But the next thing I know, I just woke up, car about 40 feet away from the line by the red light. Confused and a little bit panicked, I muttered something like, what the heck? And my boyfriend sat up and said, what just happened? I snapped at him. I said, let me know when the lights turn green. I don't know. And he said, wait, how long were we sitting here for? I shrugged. He then says, my video has been playing for 10 minutes. And went back through the video that he had just started and didn't remember any of the video in the time that had passed. It absolutely creeped me out though. In fact, I barely slept all of Saturday night, and Sunday I joked about it with my sister. But today, on the way to work, my boyfriend and I passed the same traffic light, so I asked him, what do you think happened Saturday? Weird, huh? And he had no idea what I was talking about. I recounted the entire story as specific as I could, but he didn't even remember getting home or the ride home at all. So my question for all of you guys is, what the heck actually happened? Something supernatural? Was it an abduction case? And if so, do I report it? And to where? So, it was about 11.30pm, kids are asleep, wife is sleeping next to me, dog is laying on the bed, and I was just gaming. Everything is quiet, lights are all off in the house for the night, and I'm chilling, playing some Halo I think, when all of a sudden I start hearing some heavy footsteps walking up the staircase, coming upstairs. Our stairs are very creaky, so when you get to the top of the stairs, the last four stairs will creak and they make a loud popping noise that you can hear pretty well. Normal stair sounds, right? Well, it wasn't normal to hear that at 11.30 at night when everybody else is asleep and accounted for. My blood ran cold. I suddenly got chills, and I feel like somebody is about to walk through the bedroom door I leave creaked open for our son to come and get in bed with us if he wants. I was thinking too, I know for a fact that all the doors were locked, so it's not an intruder. It's not the dog because it's sleeping on the bed. And it's not our kids because one's a baby and the other is asleep. It's not my wife because she's asleep next to me. 
and I could just feel like something was watching me through the crack in the doorway from the darkness. I know that it wasn't the house settling because it doesn't make that sound when it does, and that distinct sound is only made when somebody is walking up those stairs. The only reason that I know that it was something weird is because my wife and I have heard the same sounds before when nobody was there. And again, nobody should have been there that night. But we don't think that our place is haunted, but honestly, I don't know anymore. Who knows? Maybe we're wrong. So, a little over a week ago, I posted here with my story from this summer that had been sitting really poorly with me. I could share the whole thing, but uh, the TLDR is that late at night, my friend in a very remote cottage went outside, heard a super close, super identifiable sound of a sort of honker honker clown noise, but nothing was visible. My dog acted super weird all night while there, I didn't tell anyone. And a few months later, my buddy whose cottage it was told me that he had relentless nightmares of clowns while he slept there as a kid. There's more nuances to that, but yeah, that's the gist of it. But things have gotten so weird since then. You see, the night that I shared that, my boyfriend and I fell asleep on the couch. We went to bed and while laying there I asked if he checked the doors were locked and he said yes. I decided to get up and double check in case in our sleepy state he missed one anyway, but they were both locked. I must have woken up at around 2.30 to some weird noises that I chalked up to my downstairs neighbor having a late night. I got up to use the washroom to find the back door unlocked. Weird. I do a quick look around the house, but nothing's stolen, so I lock it and I go back to bed. Now, the following morning, I'm on my couch having a coffee. Dog is in her bed in my room still. There's like a, a sofa table and a couple of feet of space behind my couch. And I swear to you that I heard knuckles cracking, like one hand and then the other. The first thought that ran through my head was, oh no, the door was broken into last night, and someone's passed out behind the sofa, and I just didn't check here last night. I live like two blocks from a homeless encampment, but weirder things have happened in my neighborhood. And I jumped off the couch, naturally, but when I did, nobody was there. I decided that my best course of action is to just try and control my emotions, set intentions, and be firm. I have a smudge stick that someone gifted me ages ago, so I tear the house apart looking for that, open the doors and windows, and... I walk around firmly telling that whatever it is, that it is not welcome here and that I only accept love and light in this home. It was a nice day, so I left the window right behind the couch open. An hour or so later, I'm sitting there and that window slowly closes, making this horrible squeaking noise and then all of a sudden slams shut with so much force that it was hard to believe. The dog who's now beside me on the couch, gets up all freaked out, goes and sniffs the window, and then just leaves to go behind my bed where she hides in the lightning storms. So, at this point, I'm completely over this. So I went to get out of the house, but at the same time, I mean, I have all this stuff from the thread the day before running through my head about not letting this thing control my emotions. So I resolved to leave, but still calmly get ready like I normally would. I'm in the shower and I just suddenly feel very all wrong. I turned my whole body so that I could see both edges of the curtain like I was sure that something was going to reach in. I decided to be brave and slam open the curtains to find my sink cabinet doors are open and I didn't open them. Last night... I woke up in the middle of the night to two bright orange dots on the wall, opposite wall and has no windows on it. I am weirdly obsessive about no light while sleeping, so there's no little electronics projecting light or anything. And when I kind of stared at them, they got brighter, but I kind of felt like it could be an optical illusion that the longer I stare at something, the more in focus in the dark it becomes. 
Anyway, as I'm considering all of this, I realize that a third one has formed and is now getting brighter. And so, now here I am, unsure if I'm going crazy or I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to describe the feeling I'm having. It's fear adjacent, but I think I have a grasp on the idea that this thing can't really hurt me if I don't let it. I just feel kind of crazy, I guess. I haven't told anyone about this in real life and just needed to get it off my chest. Maybe just to be validated that this is weird and I am not insane. Also, I should probably mention that I've been having crazy wild nightmarish dreams all week. And this is really significant because I haven't dreamed since I was a kid. When I was 9 to 10 years old, I was laying in bed and went to get off my bed. I put my feet down on the ground and a hand shot out from under my bed and grabbed my ankle. The hand was a dark green color. It also looked really wet and sort of slimy. There was what looked like foliage or something on it too, but I don't know if they were leaves or something else. Just weird small patches that kind of resembled leaves, I guess. It seemed like the hand was trying to pull me under the bed though. It was definitely trying. As you can probably imagine too, I was screaming and I absolutely freaked out. I ran right to my parents' room and was just completely out of my mind as I was trying to tell them what happened. I still get freaked out having my feet next to under the bed like that. In the same house too, my brother had a similar experience. He said that there was a hand that grabbed his ankle too. The hand that grabbed his was completely white though, and he said it kind of resembled a Mickey Mouse glove. I often wonder if it was the same hand, and it was just changing its appearance or whatever. It does seem that that's how this kind of stuff manifests, maybe. The idea of their materialized state being dependent on their consciousness observing it. This world is way weirder than people like to give it credit for. That much is for certain. So my girlfriend and I went to pick up a pair of chairs yesterday from someone on Facebook Marketplace. We live in the northeast and it was about an hour away, but a pretty good deal. And we enjoyed a nice autumn drive anyway. I know Facebook Marketplace can be sketchy, but I didn't get any huge red flags from the seller. Their profile pic was a flower or something, but I know it's common for older people not to use a picture of themselves for that. I clicked into their profile and saw some photos of what seemed to be her, a middle-aged Chinese lady with her family. She was also being extremely cordial and nice. Last Wednesday, we agreed to meet Monday at 9am, but on Thursday night they texted me reminding me about our meetup tomorrow, Friday. I reminded them that we were meeting Monday and they apologized. Again, I didn't think that this was that weird. The listing was for eight chairs and we were just taking two, so I figured that she was coordinating with more than one person. Anyway, we got out there and I noticed once we're close that the listing has been taken down on Facebook. This wouldn't be weird if we were buying all of the chairs, but we weren't. But we pull up and it's this unmarked warehouse on a quiet street. I see one car in the way back of the warehouse, near an open garage entrance, I immediately ask my girlfriend if this seems kind of weird and she says no. The person gave us a number to call so she calls it. The person picks up and we see a young thin Chinese woman, clearly did not look like the person from the Facebook profile, come out and wave to us from afar. On the phone she really quickly says to back up towards the open garage door and gestures towards us and then she just really quickly disappears back into the garage. I drive over and start backing in toward the garage door in this little area that is fenced in from the right side. It was a very tight space too. I stop for a second and look in my rearview mirror. But the garage is pitch dark and also completely empty. No sign of anyone. Having not given us instructions other than to back in, 
I thought the seller must have wanted us to get out and walk back toward the garage with her, which I immediately knew I was not going to do. At this point, my girlfriend independently thought something was off too. Why did she just disappear like that? What was with this weird creepy warehouse? And so, having waited long enough, we pulled out and we just got out of there. Now, maybe it was nothing, but it definitely gave both of us a, a really bad feeling. And my question for all of you is, what do you think? Did we overreact or was this possibly something nefarious? My three-year-old son suffered from chronic ear infection last year, which led to him having high fevers. I slept with him on this particular night because I needed to give him Tylenol throughout the night to keep his fever down and keep him comfortable. I set my alarm to wake me up at around 2.30 in the morning. When I woke up, I went into the kitchen to get the medicine, and it was then that I noticed a bright light shining into the apartment from our back door, which also illuminated part of the woods behind the apartment. When I went over to see what it was, it turned out to be a car with those bright LED headlights in the parking lot to the far back right of the apartment. I figured that they must have just been dropping someone off. I saw the movement of what resembled a dog walking around near the woods. I started to think that the lady who usually walks her dog, a cute little corgi, in that area, in that area, purposely faced her car in that direction so she could see while she walked her dog. As I got closer though, I realized that there was nobody out there walking a dog and in fact there was no dog. Now, I don't know what it was that I actually saw, but I'll describe it in the best way that I can. At first, it looked just like a dog, corgi size, but as it walked closer, it looked like your average house cat. Then, all of a sudden, it began to look like a black bear, and then it looked like a koala almost. I live in North New Jersey, farmland and lots of woods, and I can assure you that there's no wild koalas here. At this point, my heart was pounding out of my chest and I am a bit scared. The fear I felt was like a primal type of fear I have never felt before. So I ran to my bedroom to wake up my boyfriend and I shook him awake very roughly. I said, you gotta come and see this. He was a bit annoyed with me, understandably, but when we look outside together, we see this thing getting closer and it looks like a skunk now white stripe down the center with perky fluffy tail i then said oh it's just a skunk with a little bit of a chuckle i felt a bit embarrassed to be honest that i woke him up over a skunk but at that moment i also felt a bit relieved however i was mistaken as it walked it looked as if it was struggling to find a form almost I thought it looked like it was falling apart, but also sort of coming back together again at the same time. I know that that doesn't make sense, but it's hard to find the words for what we saw. After the skunk formation, though, it looked like a person crawling on the ground with some type of fur or skin attached to them around the leg. Then it changed again and looked like a raccoon, a groundhog, black bear, cat, koala, deer, and skunk. But the part that stuck out to me the most was that... Whatever it was seemed to be coming apart or shedding, but at the same time it was growing. Whoever had their headlights on turned them off as it went deeper into the woods. This happened pretty quickly and I'd say it was only about a couple of minutes from start to finish. He ended up going back to bed, but I just couldn't sleep after that, so I grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the woods to see if I could see it again, but whatever it was, it was gone. I also opened the door to see if I could hear anything, but I couldn't. It was very quiet. I had a very hard time going back to sleep that night. My boyfriend wasn't scared, but he was confused and stunned. He didn't know what to make of it. I, on the other hand, was scared and really creeped out. I know that if I hadn't have woken him up to see it for himself, he most likely wouldn't have believed me and would have chalked it all up to me being groggy from just waking up or it just being an animal or whatever. Unfortunately though, I know what I saw and 
I will never forget it. So I'm from a small town known as Bettyville. Blink and you'll miss it. Everyone here has some kind of ghost story and I do mean everyone. The ones that always stuck with me though were my dad's stories. The ones that always stuck with me though were my dad's stories. He was always out in the backwoods. My family lives pretty much in the middle of nowhere so the woods were the only entertainment really. There's a place known as the Old Grade. It's a notorious ghost sighting spot for my family now at least. But back then, it was just a hunting spot for them. That's where they encountered the white thing. No one has a clue what it is. It's just this white creature with big black eyes about the size of a grown man's fist. My dad's first encounter was whenever he was about 16. Him and his younger brother had gone out hunting in the old grade. They had been walking for a couple of hours and dusk had taken over the woods. They saw something walking on four legs. It had a snout and looked to my uncle like a fox or coyote from a distance. He started calling it to bring it closer and that was when it stood up. It stood up on its two legs and just stared at them. My dad threw a gun on it and it hid behind a tree instantly. I don't really have a visual to describe why this was weird but... Just imagine something that's four foot wide hiding behind a two foot tree. It makes absolutely no sense, right? The chittering noise that it was making is really hard to describe. In fact, my dad said that it was too hard to describe for him. But it gave him chills talking about it. Upon seeing this though, they started backing out of the woods and stayed in the light. It didn't seem to want to get any closer if they were in the light, but was sort of moving towards them when they stepped into the shade. They made it home though, and they tried to tell my grandma what they had seen, but she just brushed it off. My dad and uncle know that they had seen something though. You can just read the dread and fear all over them when they talk about it too. And this story has always been the one to stick with me. I don't go in those woods once it gets dark. I don't even really go in the day, to be honest. I feel like whatever is haunting those woods, or whatever is in there, just doesn't want us there, and to be honest, I'm happy to oblige. So my roommate has two boys. One is around two, and the other are four to five years old. They share a room which happens to be right next to my boyfriend and I's room. Their door is often left cracked open so my roommate can check on them throughout the night. The other night my boyfriend went to go and use the bathroom but was actually stopped short by the older kid talking to something in their room. He was facing the closet while in bed saying something along the lines of no I can't go I'm in bed. His little brother was asleep and nobody else was in the room. My boyfriend went to turn on the light as he was a little bit freaked out by hearing this, only to be startled by my roommate's kid now standing at the door saying, I see you, then disappearing into the room. The next morning I was sitting at the dining room table drinking coffee when my roommate's kid comes up to me and starts describing what he was talking to last night. He said that it was all black, had one eye and hands. When I asked if he was talking about what he was talking to last night and if he talks to it often, he then said yes. This morning, his grandmother, roommate's mum, told me that he often has nightmares where he wakes up screaming. I don't know if whatever or whoever he was talking to that night is attached to him or if it's something that's in our apartment. Whatever the case, it's pretty creepy, right? I've always had an odd feeling towards their room and never really felt comfortable going into it or even being near the door really. There's been a few times my boyfriend and I have experienced odd things in this apartment as well. But this one, it definitely takes the cake for me. So 
So I'd like to share with you guys an experience that I've had with the hopes to get some advice because, quite honestly, I'm pretty scared. For context, I'm a 26-year-old male. I've never had any kind of paranormal experiences before or even believed in them. Last week, I moved to a new apartment with my two friends, 26-year-old female and a 23-year-old female, in an apartment building built probably in the 60s. The apartment has been renovated recently and looks bright and warm. It's around 100 meters squared and has three bedrooms. The wooden floor, although new, is very noisy when you step on it. The walls are consistent and you barely hear the neighbors. Our landlord is a 70 to 80 year old woman that's been nice with us. She said that the previous renters lived there for about 10 years. Now, the day we first visited the apartment, we really liked the house, but I experienced a weird feeling when I stopped in one of the bedrooms. It was just an odd sort of, I don't know, like uncanny feeling that I quickly forgot about. When we finally moved, first week, everything was normal. But two days ago, when I came back from work at about 8pm, I was on the couch in the living room in silence since nobody else was home. And I heard, suddenly, the sound of the creaky floor as if someone was standing in the hallway right in front of the bedroom where I had a feeling when I visited the flat. Then the sound of fingers scratching wood. I keep hearing those sounds for maybe about 30 minutes. I didn't move from the couch, afraid, but also believing that it probably was just a cockroach and the floor reacting to temperature or whatever. One of my roomies came home and everything was normal. The other was out, but there were no more sounds at this point. I had dinner and went to sleep at around 12.30. Once I was in my bedroom, I was lying on my bed, listening to music with pods, and... I heard something. I took them off and I'm now hearing someone stepping behind my closed door. They walk from left to right behind the door, slow but consistent steps. You could tell by the sound that it was an adult body as well. I open WhatsApp and write in the group chat that I have with the roomies here and write to them to stop doing that. They didn't take it seriously though when I told them about the sounds in the hallway and that I thought that they were pulling a prank. Neither the roomie that went to sleep to her bedroom or the one that was out and had returned home opening the door unnoticedly thought that I was being serious. They answer me and send me pictures, audios and live location but I keep hearing vividly someone slowly walking behind the door. Then they knock quiet and slow knocks. My bedroom is very small and the bed is right in front of the door. I was totally conscious and aware of what was happening. It's not noises from the neighbors. It's right in front of the door in fact. So I texted in the group, quick come. Then I hear my roomie's door opening, her turning the hallway lights on and her opening my bedroom door. She was scared asking what was going on. I was sitting in bed realizing that someone was there and it was neither of them. I had a bit of a panic attack. I started hyperventilating and feeling my arms numb. Then I started crying and remained at shock all night. My other roomie quickly came home and they tried to give rational explanations. I slept on the couch with the lights and the TV on that night. Tonight I've done the same. We haven't noticed any noises or weird feelings since then, but I'm constantly afraid and can't see the moment to sleep again in my bedroom. But I am convinced that whatever that was, it actually happened. There was someone behind the door, walking around it and knocking. I don't know what to do about it, but this whole thing definitely has me rattled. For about two years now, I occasionally hear what clearly is a hand hitting the wall between my room and the attic. Now, before anyone says chipmunks or insert vermin, please just rule that out. Trust me, I've had the area inspected by pest control so many times and there is no visible infestation and traps and baits were set and to which go undisturbed even to today. If it is not happening from the other side of the bedroom wall in the attic, 
then the only other place that it can be coming from is the exterior part of the wall. Picture a garage roof line butting up against a house, wherein the attic is above the garage. This has happened at all hours of the day, mind you, and mostly when I'm alone, but it's happened with my wife in the room too. As a matter of fact, my wife and I hear noises in the house frequently. But we are constantly going back and reviewing our security cameras to explain them away, and I would say that a good 80% cannot be explained away. Again, trust me, if anyone is looking for a causation, it is me, a semi-non-believer in the paranormal. But there is just no way to explain this stuff. I've also been in my basement studio and I've heard my wife and kids come through the garage door. I hear the kids running. I have a hot microphone on and studio headphones on as well. I can definitely hear. But when I go upstairs, they're not home yet. There was this one night though when I heard this tapping on the basement bedroom window. This is a finger tapping a window, absolutely clear as day. I'm 43 years old and I know what that sounds like. I also know that there's nothing near that window to make such a sound. I have that window blocked 100% by a perfectly fitted painting so no one can actually see in or out. This goes on for about 10 minutes so... I sort of sneak down the hall to the kids' playroom. Think of the letter L and the two windows are equally spaced from the corner. I sneak over, lights are off. I can see very well, except the shadows of the trees being casted by the streetlights. I just sit there for about 10 minutes, but nothing. The tapping seemed to stop too. I didn't even get two steps into the hallway though and I heard that tap one time on the playroom window. I was annoyed at this point and so I darted towards the door grabbing one of the guns on route and I'm telling you that no one could have escaped my eyesight by then but when I got there there was no one there. I went back and looked at the cameras and I did everything that I could think of but there was just nothing. One thing we have caught on camera though is this very loud foot stomp from our bedroom just above the living room. I wasn't home, but my wife and kids are visibly startled as the stomp was so hard that the ceiling light flickered. And again, there is just really no explanation for this. And no, I will not accept house settling or vermin. That is clearly a foot stomping the floor so hard that the lights flickered. Now, the main level laundry room separates my studio from our master bathroom on the second level. My wife has a rolling chair at her vanity and... I can hear her rolling around when she's getting ready. I shouldn't, but I do, and well, I've texted her at like 2 or 3 in the morning before, asking why she's rolling up and around like that. But there's always no response, and when I check, she's asleep, so it is definitely not her. Other than that, I hear what sounds like a, a man tapping his cane on the floor above my studio quite often. I'm an engineer, I get mechanical systems and knocking and I can assure you that there are no systems or equipment or associated lines in the vicinity that could cause it. Yes, I randomly get scared and hair stand up on my neck occasionally for no reason. Yes, I see something constantly moving in my peripheral upstairs in the hallway. I sleep with the door open and nightlight on and the hallway is always on. Yes, the barn door to the bonus room was closed one morning after I intentionally left it open. Same in the hallway. Whatever this is, I do fear that it's like a small little demon or something. My wife and I watched some documentary on NASA engineers that got haunted by this little guy in the same room. My son, seven at the time, actually fell asleep in there that night watching some kid movie. I woke him up in the morning and... The first thing that he said was, I woke up earlier, I heard little footsteps walk around the bed. I said, oh, it must have been the dog. And he replied, no dad, it was the footsteps of a small human. My garage caught on fire twice that week too, which is weird, but anyway, there's a lot more to this, but this definitely captures the essence of what's happening here. I don't know what to do about any of this because, well... It's definitely not my forte. Like I said, I've always been a bit skeptical about this stuff and so I've just never really looked into it. 
but now that I'm facing it, I would really like some help. Many years ago before cell phones, I, a 20-year-old female then, had driven over to visit my grandmother and was on my way home. She lived in a very nice part of town. I'd only recently got my driver's license and in my state, you are required to display P plates in your car windows. The P stands for probationary, but we used to say pick on me or perv magnet plates. In other words, just displaying those plates on your car pretty much guaranteed that you were going to be hassled on the road as a young person. And also, if you drove a small white sedan, you were likely to be female, which was all the more reason to be hassled on the road back then. So, I turned out of my grandmother's street onto the highway. There was no traffic on the highway when I turned onto it, and I had driven no more than 300 meters when... I heard this sudden loud honking right behind me, frightening the heck out of me. I stuck my arm out the window and waved, a circle signal motioning to pass me in case the driver thought that I was going too slow, which I wasn't, mind you. The car then pulled out and began driving right next to me. All of a sudden, though, this creepy older-looking man in an expensive plain white sedan honked again and was motioning at me to pull over to the side of the road and or to wind down my window. I mouthed no at him. He got more insistent and looked angry as he continued driving right next to me, which is also illegal because he was blocking the entire highway. So creepy man let off a couple more short honks to make me look at him again and flashed his black wallet with some sort of raised metal silver looking crest on it. He was now looking ragingly angry and was pointing at the shield wallet in his hand like he thought that it meant that he was some sort of secret police and had some sort of authority to pull me over. As far as I was concerned, I had not done anything wrong. He was not police. My car was recently serviced, so I knew that there was nothing wrong with it, which means that there was just no possible reason for this creepy-looking guy to pull me over, and I was starting to feel more than a little frightened at this. I decided to brake suddenly so that I could read his car's rear license plate in case he tried to run me off the road or something. The plate said CDEC. Weird. I had no idea what that meant other than that it was notably odd. In a split second decision though I chucked an immediately left turn off the highway and drove fast down a few back streets and laneways. This was the area that I had grown up in walking around with my grandmother so I knew exactly where I was going. I was so creeped out that I didn't check my rearview mirror though for a couple of turns, so I had no idea if the guy tried to follow me or if he just took off down the highway, but either way, in the end, thankfully I lost him. I went to work on the Monday and told the story and one of my older colleagues said to me, that's a consular license plate, which means that the car belongs to a foreign embassy. Intriguing, but... I didn't give it much thought, except in years later, retelling the tale when I wanted to explain to people why I have a chip on my shoulder when it comes to middle-aged male drivers, I began to realize that there was something very off about it. Fast forward to now when we have YouTube with endless true crime content on tap, and I watch cold case and true crime shows. Deep in the YouTube comments of a video about a young woman who vanished without a trace, was a comment along the lines of, this sounds similar to a few cold cases around the world where it is suspected that young women have been abducted by someone working for a foreign embassy. And diplomatic immunity means that they can move around the world and keep doing what they do with impunity. So, my question is, could that have been what that creepy man was trying to do all those years ago on a beautiful sunny summer day? Abduct me in broad daylight. So for context, I grew up in the suburbs and outside of the occasional play park or sports field, there was really nothing to do. Me and my neighbours used to play knock and run, or its other name, ding dong ditch. For context, I have a sister who is a year younger than me, and my neighbour James was the same age as me. His older sister was 14 at the time, and she also played with us from time to time. 
Although, I think that she just wanted to hang out with my sister, whom she thought was cute. I was admittedly the biggest coward in the group, and to this day, my flight instinct is significantly stronger than my fight instinct. So, I would never ring the doorbell, as I would always find a way to wiggle out of it. I always found watching it more entertaining than doing it, I suppose. On this particular afternoon, my cousins came over. One of my cousins was my age, the other was a few years younger than me and couldn't play with us, and the other was a year older than me, but everyone treated him like he was an adult, even though he was only 11, which was weird. Or at least, that's how I perceived it, I guess. But his name was Daniel, and he is somewhat important to this story. I'm not a reliable storyteller by any means, as it has been almost 10 years since these events, but... I'll try my hardest to remember them. Anyway, here's what happened. So, my cousins came over and we were banished outside to play, and we all decided that knock and run was a good idea. We usually just played around our immediate street, never venturing further than the next street over out of fear of getting lost in the copy and pasted suburban streets. But we made our way up the street to the play park on top of the hill, it sat where a house could have been and somewhat could cut across into and onto the next road. As we sat on the play equipment, we decided that a vote should decide who knocked first and, of course, I was picked. I remember getting myself out of it and I got my older cousin to take my place. I am thankful that he was and is proud as he is. It helped me get out of a lot of situations. We decided that our first target would be the fanciest looking house in the area. A white marble house with a fountain in the front yard and a curved driveway. I remember sitting next to a car. I was small enough to look under it from the curb. And I had a clear view of my cousin sneaking up to the door and ringing the doorbell three times in order to get the attention of whoever was inside. And he bolted down the pathway towards the street to hide behind the cars. But before he got to the fence... An older man in a black leather apron with what I assumed was paint came sprinting after him. I immediately knew that something was wrong. This wasn't the usual response to a knock and run. Sure, we've encountered some angry people before, but this was something different. He practically flew down the walkway towards Daniel and threw his hand out to grab him. This didn't feel like anything someone his age could do, in fact, and... It scared all of us a lot. I think I might have been the only one with a clear view of what was going on in the end, which meant that I was the first to see what was happening. It wasn't until the man was practically on top of Daniel that he noticed that he was being chased, and the scream that he made when he realized will always stick with me. As I said at the start of this, Daniel was and is still a very proud person, who will always try to prove himself. So, hearing this scream of pure terror really struck at my core. Everyone was clued in at this point as to what was happening. Daniel didn't open the waist-high gate at the end of the path. He just jumped it, which I think ultimately saved him from getting hurt as the old man had taken a second to open it. Daniel was sprinting down the street as fast as I had ever seen him. The guy was yelling at him and... He had a deep and angry voice, which did actually stop Daniel in his tracks. They were both standing in the middle of the road at this point, reminding me of sort of an old western movie when two cowboys would be standing at either end of the main road. The man marched straight up into Daniel's face, and I could finally get a good look at him. His skin resembled rough leather, and the few strands of hair on his head had long since grayed. He was clean-shaven and he was wearing white pants, a white button-up, and a black leather apron that had what I rationalized as red paint on it. After he was maybe a half a foot from Daniel, he started to berate him and I could only make out the words, sick people in there. Everything about this man threw me off and I could see my neighbor and my other cousin who was hiding in the bushes felt the same. My neighbor's older sister, whom I'll call Tay, screamed out at him from the other side of the road, which gave Daniel the opportunity to run as fast as he could away from the man. We all ran at this point. I don't think I or anyone else knew where we were running off to, but 
I found myself in the car park of the shopping center across the road from me. I waited there for maybe 30 minutes, just watching cars come in and out, feeling safer with a large group of people. I had no idea at the time if he chased one of us, but I knew that I was safe. I made my way back to my house and found that I was the last one to return, apparently. My cousin Daniel, he ran straight home and Tay followed him. My other cousin and neighbor ran around the suburbs for a bit before deciding to go home. My mum was missing when I got home and I realized that she had been told about what had happened. My mother is someone who isn't afraid of protecting her own and she is one of the strongest people that I know so I felt pretty safe that she was aware and was off telling him to get lost but when she got back she seemed a bit off. She didn't want to talk about it or anything and any color from her face had completely drained. We slept at my neighbor's house that night because my mom wanted to talk to my dad about something serious and I think that we all knew what it was about. Nothing really happened for a while after that too. Not for a while anyway, but my mum was a lot more protective, I guess, of what we did outside. We were no longer allowed to play knock and run or go up the road without a parent. It really bugged my sister, who loved to play outside, but I don't think she fully understood what actually happened. But before I get on to the next set of events, I think it's important to address some things. I know that we were the ones who originally disturbed him. Look, I get that, but I think it's important to know about how this all sort of kicked off. First things first too, I did promise some people that I would ask my mum what the old man had told her that last night at dinner and I did manage to do so. She was surprised that I remembered what happened and tried to sweep it under the rug initially, but I kept pressing her for answers. I'm not proud of pressuring my mother into talking to me about something like this, but I guess curiosity got the better of me. I know that it isn't an excuse, but I feel somewhat justified by my actions, I guess. Anyway, after I pressed her for more answers, she grabbed my arm and led me to my room before placing me on my bed. She sat next to me and told me not to repeat anything of what she was about to say to my sister, my cousins, or anyone else who was involved with this man throughout that year. She finally opened up about how she was sitting at home watching TV when she heard a loud knock on the front door. It was my cousin Daniel and my neighbor Tay who looked terrified and exhausted. After letting them in and grilling them for answers, my mum was rightfully pretty ticked off that someone had spoken to them in such a way and so she got up to go and confront the man and on her way out, my other cousin and neighbor arrived whom she also sent inside. She was initially concerned about where I was, but Daniel made it clear that I ran in the opposite direction of the man and that he would go looking for me, which he didn't in the end. My mum made her way up the play park and saw the man pacing back and forth up and down in his driveway. He didn't seem angry or upset, I guess. He apparently didn't seem like anything besides someone marching back and forth, which took my mother's mood from enraged to sort of confused. She walked up to the front gate and let herself in, which made the man almost stop immediately and stare at her. I'm surprised that she didn't turn back and go home at this point, because that's what I and what I imagine anyone would have done. But as I said before, I am a bit of a coward after all, so yeah, there is that. Anyway, the man marched up to my mum and started to berate with her about trespassing on his property which she met by berating him about terrifying some kids. This apparently went on for a couple of minutes before he said something that honestly terrified her. My mum didn't say exactly what he said because she said that she was trying to forget it, but he said something along the lines of, I'll show both of you what it feels like to have somebody on your property when you don't want them there, and then I'll shut those kids up forever. He also tried to grab her at that point, but she quickly moved away and left his yard, swiftly walking back home, and this really affected my mum. But that was the answer that I got from her. I gave her a hug and apologized for pressing her to tell me, and we got back to dinner shortly after this. I don't regret her telling me, but it just feels like knowing the end of a movie and seeing all of the hints leading up to it, I guess. 
recontextualizing a lot of stuff. But anyway, it had been about a month, maybe a, a month and a half since the first initial incident with the man. We hadn't seen him since then, and I had pretty much forgotten about it until I went to the shops one day. My parents had started to let me go to the shops by myself to grab little things for them. I was young at the time and the shops were across the road from me, so getting there wasn't really an issue. But one day, my dad asked me to go and grab a loaf of bread for him. He gave me a $2 coin and sent me on my way to the shops. I was getting used to doing this on my own and enjoying my independence a bit. I grabbed the bread, which was on the far side of the large supermarket, and made my way towards the registers. I stopped by the toy aisle and took a look at all the low-quality mass-produced action figures that I desperately wanted at that time. This was part of my routine. In fact, even now if I wanted something but didn't have money to get it, I would just take a look at it. But on this occasion, honestly, I really wish that I would have just continued on to the registers because I felt two hands push me to the ground from my left. I was shocked for a moment as I didn't fully know what had just happened. The sticky and dusty floor beneath me really hurt. It took me a second to look at my attacker and when I did, I immediately knew that something was very wrong. It was the old man from up the road. He had found me in the place that I had initially hid from him just a month prior. He started to shout at me but I really couldn't understand what he was saying. I don't know if it was the adrenaline ringing in my ears or his rage just taking over, but the tone in which he was shouting shook me. I tried to get up and run. When I planted my foot on the ground to get up, he kicked it from below me, which made me fall back onto the ground. Thank the Lord that a staff member arrived at this point. They must have heard his shouting from across the store and came to check on what was happening. I never got a good look at the staff member, but I am thankful for whoever they are. As I got up to run with the loaf of bread in my hand, I could hear the man reacting to me getting away and it took everything in me to not look behind me to look at him, but I knew that he was absolutely furious just based off of his tone. I ran straight out of the store with the bread without realizing it and I almost threw up from all of the emotions. I told my parents when I got home and they both made it clear that I wouldn't be going on any shopping trips by myself from here on out. However, they didn't think about how me and my sister walked together to school, which in hindsight should have been something that they thought of. Now, the trip to my school wasn't a long one by any means. It was just over a kilometer long or just over half a mile, but the trip was still tough on my small legs. There were quite a few hills which added time to our trip there and the path went along a sort of creek with nothing around it. It was actually quite nice and pretty isolated, which honestly helped me relax my mind after school a lot. But not long after the supermarket incident, me and my sister were walking home from school and just made our way to the beginning of the path along the creek when we saw an SUV that had been parked there for what I assumed had been a while. I thought that it was empty initially, but as you can probably guess, it wasn't. We turned to enter the creek when the SUV car door opened and we heard someone shouting at us like, hey, do you guys want to drive home? Instantly, I recognized that voice too. It was the man. My sister, who was always trusting of others, started to walk towards the truck, but I quickly held her back. What's wrong? The man said in a cheerful tone. This was very different from the unintelligible screaming from just the week before, and I obviously wanted nothing to do with this man. I quickly started to lead my sister towards the creek, and the man quickly scooted over towards the door. Wait up, I'll walk you home, he said. I should have run up the hill towards the school, but instead, I started to sprint down the creek. Looking back at this, I feel really stupid for doing this. Daniel was faster than me and the man had been able to catch up with him in seconds, but for some reason he didn't leave his truck. All I heard was another unintelligible scream and his truck driving away. My sister was beyond angry that we didn't get a ride home and that we had to walk, but I didn't care. 
she and I were safe and so we continued walking along the path. Thinking back on it, the path was beautiful and connected on either side to small quiet streets, the perfect in-between of isolation. Sadly, my young mind didn't realize that the creek opened to two quiet streets and so when I saw that same silver SUV on the street at the end of the path, I just froze. What could I have done? I felt powerless and had to take care of my sister, who was only now figuring out that this man may not actually have good intentions. I decided that the best course of action was to cross the creek and walk through the bushes to the other side. This was a beyond dangerous idea as there were slippery rocks, animals and running water as well. This very easily could have injured or even killed us but somehow we managed. We climbed over logs of wood and under tree branches, through prickly bushes and through large plants but we managed to do it and cross over to the other road that we followed towards the main road, which took us home. Now, obviously those two SUVs, they could have been different, but at the time I remember that I was absolutely certain that they were the same. And even now I'm not 100% sure if they were actually different. I only found out about this later, but my parents got the police involved at this point. But based on the fact that more stuff had happened... I'm going to say that they probably didn't do much. There were a few other things that happened throughout this time too, like mail being stolen, our bins being pushed over, the front door knocking at early hours of the morning that we knew was him, although we really didn't have any real proof. But the last thing that I'll bring up before I end this is something that I'm not 100% sure was a dream or not. For context, my dad used to have campouts with me and my sister. We would sleep out on the couch and my dad would sleep on a mattress on the floor. The couches that we would sleep on were right next to the front door in the living room and we would watch movies with pizza or some other type of takeaway. It was really fun and I remember those nights fondly but one particular night will stick with me forever. Everyone else had gone to sleep at this point and Naruto was on. I hadn't watched or read Naruto at that point, but I recognized the characters. I was sitting directly next to the large window that sort of looked out into the driveway. I was just enjoying doing nothing when I saw some movement out on the driveway. I looked out there and there he was, walking up to our front door, wearing his white pants and white button-up t-shirt. He was staring directly at our front door with such focus that... It felt like nothing would break it, but something did, and it was me. He looked at me, and I could see in his eyes that it was sort of funny to him. He simply held his hand up, waved at me, and then placed one finger on his mouth as if he were telling me to shush, and then he jogged away. I surprisingly fell asleep not long after this, and for the longest time I thought that it was a dream, until I read all of Naruto and recognized the scene that I remember playing. It was then that I realized that it might not actually have been a dream and that he might have been attempting something and after what my mum had told me, I think I know what he was trying to do. My old house was always creepy. I remember at a very young age, about six years old, being super excited as a vicar was coming around to talk with my mother. She suffered severe mental health all her life and, at the time, was looking to religion for help. Unfortunately for me, his visit was after my bedtime, but I couldn't sleep in hope that I'd be allowed downstairs. I was just one of those kids that always wanted to meet new people. Eventually, I heard someone walking up the stairs. The house was very old and very creaky, and towards my bedroom. My bedroom door opened, and I listened as the floorboards made their usual noise as someone was walking across my bedroom, but there was nobody there. I had a nightlight on in my room, so I could see very well. That sort of thing would happen quite often, usually just opening my bedroom door and the feeling of being watched. 
I can't say that I was scared back then, but I did realize that it was strange. Fairly uneventful experiences until 1995, and then I remember it like it was yesterday. Now, I was 15 years old and home alone. My parents had long since divorced. My dad, who I lived with, was spending the night with my now stepmother, who lived two streets away. We were moving from the house and I was packing up my bedroom. It should have been anyway, but basically I was watching wrestling. At about midnight, I went to bed, was reading a magazine, and suddenly I felt the most awful fear and became extremely nauseous. My dog and cat were in the bedroom with me. My dog began hysterically whining and barking at the whole room. She even peed on the floor, which she never did. My cat was in the windowsill with her face pressed against the curtain and was crying pitifully. I suddenly realized I was being watched from the corner of the room as my dog barked and backed off of that part of the room. I couldn't even lift my head to look as the fear was disabling to me, but eventually I was able to get up and run for it. The worst part of it all was I felt this presence right behind me. I got to the front room and rang my father that he needed to get here very fast. I was terrified beyond words with this unexplainable feeling of fear of being stared at. It was actually sort of painful. I know it makes no sense now, but that's how it felt at the time. I don't know how I managed to unlock the front door and run into the street and fell into the middle of the road, all the time being watched by something which was now in the doorway staring. What it looked like, I have no idea. It's like my brain just never put two and two together. My poor dog, though, was stuck halfway on the stairs, crying and terrified. As my dad arrived, he was able to go and get her, and I never went back into that house ever again after that. My dad talked to me the next day and said that his experiences in that house were pretty bad, too. For instance, he'd always nag me to hold the banister coming downstairs. He told me the reason being that he'd often be grabbed and tripped. He said upstairs of the house was by far the worst, and he never mentioned it to me as he didn't want to scare me. There was also this reoccurring dream as well. I'd say that it started a year or so after leaving the house, 1996-ish. It started with me coming home from school, sunny day, feeling very happy, going into the front room of the house and everything seems good. Then I walk towards the back of the house into the kitchen and it's heavily raining and getting very dark outside. I now head outside in the garden and there's a storm outside. I'm getting absolutely drenched and the wind is hammering me and I suddenly realize that I'm sobbing uncontrollably. Then this feeling overcomes me. I'm facing away from the house and I can feel that I'm being watched from my bedroom window. My bedroom window looked out towards the garden. I finally brace myself and get the courage and turn towards the house to look at this thing. And each time I would always wake up. But about 15 years ago, I'd usually have this dream like two or three times a month. I had the dream again. I turned around. And this time, I made eye contact and saw that it was the same face that had chased me out of the house all those years ago. I woke up and I instantly forgot the face and that was the last, that was the last time that I ever had that dream. I never experienced anything like this since and to be honest I really hope that I never do. It was terrifying and I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. So I recently started working at a 911 dispatcher at a police department in Oklahoma, and I really love it. Tonight, one of my co-workers was talking to me about ghosts, and I told him that I didn't really believe in them. And he said, oh, you will. And later on that night, it was about 3 a.m., the 911 phone rings. And this is not a landline, it only answers and rings for 911. He says, come and get this phone so I do. I answer the call and 
Immediately, I hear heavy breathing. I proceed to ask if they can hear me, who is calling, and after 43 seconds, they hang up. He laughs and turns and points to the map. This phone number was a landline and was plotted in the middle of an old base camp cemetery just outside of town. Nobody lives within five miles of this place. The mapping on 911 landlines is always within five inches of the caller. It's really accurate. He then told me to redial the number. I did and the number is not available. He then proceeds to tell me that this happens every night. The supervising officer came in and I asked him how long this had happened and he said every night for at least 23 years. That's how long he's been there for anyway. They used to send officers out apparently but it's gated and they've checked everything and there's nobody there. So somebody calls 911 from an abandoned cemetery every night from a landline number that isn't available for over 20 years? This is real too. I'm not kidding. I saw and heard this happen tonight even and I'm in shock. No way a prank has gone on this long. There's no way that a landline cord reaches five miles in length to even reach the cemetery. The calls change times too. Like tonight it was at 3.07am but it ranges from midnight to 4am every single night. This is an abandoned burial ground mind you so... There's really nothing there. If you've got any explanations for this, then I'm all ears because this whole thing just seems absolutely crazy to me. I, a 40-year-old female, went to the university at Buffalo fresh out of high school in the early 2000s. At the time, the online world was a, a bit like the Wild West, which included having to do quite a bit more digging to find specific information than today's split-second Google search. As such, it was a much easier time for colleges and universities to hide or spin campus crime statistics to make themselves look better for prospective wallets, I mean students. Case in point, I was at an orientation a month or two before my freshman year, and one of the mass presentations I had to attend was about campus safety. Bright-faced, upperclassmen orientation aides enthusiastically and verbally filleted the school, boasting about how North Campus was in, at the time, the safest town in the country, Amherst, New York, and that the only murder in recent history has occurred nine years ago to an unfortunate student named Linda Yellum, who was murdered on the campus's bike path during a lone early morning run. It was a fate that we were assured could be avoided by simply not hitting the bike path alone. What they conveniently didn't reveal was that A, the killer hadn't been caught, and B, Yalom wasn't his only victim. He was a serial rapist and eventual serial killer who had already been active in the area for at least 25 years in downtown Buffalo and on the secluded bike paths of the Buffalo suburbs too. In retrospect, had this information been as readily accessible as it is now, it probably would have kept me from the most bone-chilling encounter of my life. So, fast forward three years. I was a very depressed 20-year-old who was struggling with her sexual identity and her parents' reaction to it in a much less accepting time than now. I'd left school and, to avoid being home, shacked up with a woman who'd promised me the world but then rejected me in favor of her ex-girlfriend on the night that I moved in, and eventually turned out to be a felon who drained vulnerable would-be love interest bank accounts, though that's a very convoluted story for another time. So clearly, I was an unhappy young adult desperate for love and a sense of belonging, sometimes to my own detriment. Despite my roommate's many kind and hurtful gestures, I stuck with it in the naive hope that she would eventually come around and fulfill her pie-in-the-sky promises to me. On a particular July night, that hope just fell flat. I was at Roxy's Green Room, a now-defunct lesbian bar and club that many wayward buffalo lesbians, myself included, flocked to at night to feel a much-needed sense of community and to hopefully lend a special someone. Since the latter just wasn't happening for me, and since I didn't yet know what kind of person she really was, I was still stuck on my roommate. 
She liked to dangle emotional carrots overhead out of some sick joy that she got from making me hurt, but also hang on to hope and... After a promise to hit Roxy's alone with me and talk about us, she showed up with her ex turned current and shut me out. I was wounded and upset enough to leave at around 1 in the morning, well before the 4am last call that I was still young and spry enough to stomach and without a ride home like my usually wiser self would have secured, I left. While my apartment on Delaware was walking distance from Rocky's, it was a good half an hour walk and being as emotionally charged as I was, I angrily hoofed it down the main street sidewalk, still managing to follow the pedestrian rule of walking against the traffic, despite stupidly ignoring a rule that I knew well from years of watching forensic shows. If you're a woman, never leave a bar at night alone, especially if you're walking. I got exactly halfway home when a dark green sedan started driving toward me. I didn't think much of it until the car slowed down near me as I walked. A lone, middle-aged man was in the car with a skin tone that I originally associated with a guy being Italian, but in retrospect, he could have easily been Puerto Rican. He had dark hair and, most importantly, almost impossibly dark eyes that seemed to hold no light of good intentions. Now, I was used to guys being pigs at times. I'd been catcalled by downtown construction workers when an ex-girlfriend and I shared a kiss, and I had endured all matter of wholly unwanted graphic and ham-fisted advances from dudes at school. And although I'd never take the stance that I was asking for it or anything, I was young and thin, so I was dressed in a tight red crop top with a flare-legged black spandex pants. The get-up was meant to turn women's heads, so I wasn't exactly surprised that I caught the attention of the wrong sex. I paid it little mind past mild irritation that a guy old enough to be my dad would look at me like that as the guy drove off and turned at the next intersection behind me. My walk resumed. I put the guy out of my mind and I continued my trek. But that piece, it didn't last. About two or three minutes later, I see a similar green car coming up on me again. This time, the guy's window was down a bit and he shouted, hey, in a sort of beckoning manner, and gestured in a way that made me wonder if he thought that I was a, a lady of the night or something. Now, that incensed me. Despite my recent struggles with my identity and the resulting entropy in my life, I was always a good kid. I flashed him a quick annoyed look to inform him that despite the mildly revealing clothing, he was barking up the wrong tree for several reasons and then I ignored him, focusing forward. He sped off again and then he turned again. At that point, it was clear that the dude was casing me like a cat burglar cases a house. It was before the time of Uber or even widespread use of cell phones and with no cabs passing by, I had little hope of getting one. Public transit existed but it was both sparse and not running nearby. The stretches of Maine between intersections were long and I'd probably be spotted on them anyway since the guy was circling being 15 minutes away from Roxy's and my home, there was also no way that I could get anywhere near either place before the green car came back around again. So I quickly thumbed through my mental rolodex of true crime show inspired safety tips that should have kept me out of this situation in the first place. Like tip one, get to an open business, inform the clerk, have him or her call the police and stay put. Then the guy would either give up or get caught. I was coming up in the convenience store where on the opposite side of the street where I'd bought a pack of cigarettes earlier in the night but as I got closer the desolate blackness through the windows told me that it was closed. I looked around for something else, another bar, a gas station, anything but the street was flanked by shuttered brick buildings and a locked up church. And then came the headlights and green again. Again the guy slowed down as he approached me but his demeanor had shifted again. He put his palm out impatiently as if he couldn't understand my lack of complicity. Come on, the guy yelled through his now open window, his face an equal picture of aggression, intimidation and frustration. I kept out of arm's reach on the sidewalk and once again ignored him but this time I was properly shaken. He angrily punched the gas and was off on his familiar circuit back around to me again. Now I knew that I was in trouble. The guy's behavior was escalating and I was genuinely scared that his next move would be to grab me off the sidewalk and pull me into his car. From there, God only knew what sort of depravity I was in for. 
I scrambled through my memory for another safety tip, and I remembered that making myself both impossible to ignore and obviously in distress could get me some much needed attention from an outside party. So I ran into the middle of Main Street and started frantically waving my hands and shouting at every car that was coming my way. The first car drove by, the second car drove by. The terror in me was now palpable. I knew the stories of city dwellers who were left to their horrible fates at the hands of monsters by jaded throngs of people who heard the attacks perpetrated on them and their cries for help but did nothing out of both an assumption that someone else would step up and reluctance to get involved. And I wondered, would I be the next victim of the bystander effect, snatched away to an early end because of big city indifference? As I was beginning to lose hope, but still determined to keep trying while thinking of my next bold move, a van pulled over that had four black guys in it. As a white woman, I was relieved. I knew that statistically, male predators overwhelmingly tend to prey on women of their same race. In a game of numbers, this van full of guys was exponentially safer than that single stalker in the green car. So, I opted to take the gamble. I frantically told them about the man in the green car who kept circling around the block and following me and begged for a ride home. The driver asked if I had any money in exchange for the favor. I didn't. Then he asked if I had any cigarettes. I may be one of the only people you'll ever meet who actually had her life saved by smokes too, but though I had never been a smoker before, I briefly picked up the filthy habit because New York State bars still allowed smoking and it was a weird part of Buffalo lesbian bar culture that I emulated to fit in. Yet another way that I was, as are many, kind of an idiot in my early 20s. But yes, I answered urgently. I just bought a pack and you can have the whole thing if you get me home. Adamantly, I was initially a little miffed that the driver wanted something from me in exchange for not letting me get abducted off the street, as well as the implication that he may not have helped me if I had nothing. Still, I had the Malboros, and he had a vehicle, and the stars had hopefully aligned. Regardless of how it went down, I had help if he let me in, and the details didn't matter. After a second or two of thought, which seemed like an eternity to me, the driver agreed, and one of the two dudes in the back opened the side door for me and got out so that I could slide into the seat behind the driver. As the door to my safe carriage full of impromptu nights shut and I got buckled in, I looked out of my window just in time to see the green car creeping past the van and proving to my saviors that I was telling a very disturbing true story. And until my dying day, I will never forget that man's eyes. Feeling safe surrounded by a closed van full of young, tough-looking rescuers, I looked at this guy dead in the eyes. Part of me was rightfully terrified, but another part of me wanted to look right at him defiantly and tell him with my eyes, I got away from you. I win. I was repaid with the most evil, hateful look that I'd ever had directed at me, let alone seen. His eyes were black, black like a cat's eyes get when it sees a bug in the house and its hunting insects causes its pupils to blow to allow more light in. But at least there's usually a hint of playful mischief in a hunting cat's eyes. The eyes that I was seeing were those of just pure, unadulterated predator and the vitriol that practically oozed from them as he glared at me let me know exactly how he felt about his prey, having the audacity to elude him. He drove off into the night, and so did we, in a bit less direct route to make sure that we lost him. After a blessedly quick jaunt with frequent looks behind my shoulder, I was delivered home, one pack of cigarettes short but alive and in one piece. The first thing that I did when I got in the door was to check the locks on absolutely everything. After that, the adrenaline started to wear off and the pure fear set in. I was so terrified that the man in the green sedan was searching the area when I got dropped off that I grabbed the cordless phone, then lay completely flat on the living room floor for hours to keep totally out of sight from any of my apartment windows. As I lay there, I called the Buffalo police and relayed my terrifying tale in as much detail as I could give them. Being painfully aware of the prevalence of hate crimes against the LGBT community at the time, I told the cops that it was possible that the man was cruising near Roxy's to prey on vulnerable queer women who were out and about. In hindsight, I think the guy just saw who he thought was an easy mark out by herself and availed himself of the opportunity to strike. So. 
Fast forward another four years and I'd moved out to Chicago to live with my then girlfriend. For about half of my four years there, I was pretty homesick, I admit. I'd never lived anywhere except my home state of New York and I went there knowing no one accepted my ex, who wasn't exactly an empathetic soul, adding to my feelings of isolation. I coped by keeping up on upstate New York news so I'd feel a little less far away, I guess. But on a chilly mid-January morning in 2007, I was at our computer looking up headlines from my home state when one from the WBFO popped up that immediately snared my attention. Bike path rapist is arrested. By then, I knew the moniker well. The internet had since aged into a beautifully organized repository of sometimes knowledge and despite the lack of transparency from my alma mater, I became familiar with the Buffalo area mystery man and his active status throughout my time in Buffalo. And now, I had a name for the spectre responsible for that bit of eeriness that was always in the back of my mind when I was a student. The bike path rapist was revealed as Altemio Sanchez, a middle-aged native of Puerto Rico who coached his son's sports teams and was affectionately referred to as Uncle Al in his neighborhood. As with many other killers, his disguises were his community involvement and just being ordinary. The man was estimated to have been responsible for 9 to 15 rapes around the Buffalo area since 1975 and had confessed to three murders, the Yalom murder in 1991, a second in 1992, and a third which had occurred only three and a half months prior to this capture. And I don't know if you've ever felt your heart somehow get wedged up into your voice box and get dropped into the depths of your stomach simultaneously, but believe me when I say that it's possible given the right catalyst. For me, that catalyst was the printed proof that the man was active while I lived in Buffalo and frequented Roxy's. More so, I knew that serial killers rarely take breaks as lengthy as the one between his 1992 and 2006 killings. He had to have at least been attempting to satiate his evil impulses for those 14 years. And that realization gave me a very, very bad feeling that... I'd crossed paths with someone much more dangerous than I'd realized. The news article had no picture of Sanchez, but this sickening feeling in me prodded me to find one, and it was almost as if I knew what I would see before I even looked at him. I Yahoo searched his name, because that was still a respectful means of finding things on the internet in 2007, and I was horrified, though not surprised, to see those same black soulless predatory eyes that... I looked into four times on that summer night in Buffalo in 2003. The timeline fit. My profile as a victim fit. In fact, the fact that he had mistaken me for a downtown prostitute and barring all else, I knew those eyes. I had a potentially deadly close encounter with Artemio Sanchez, the bike path rapist, aka the bike path killer. My lack of sense put me in his orbit and a van of angels pulled me out of it. I know who I saw and as God is my witness, I will never be convinced otherwise. Though many of his rapes fell victims to statutes of limitation, he pled guilty to the three murders and was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. In essence, the guy won't be exposed to the outside again unless he's the one in a body bag. So before I begin, this encounter happened about 10 years ago. I was 22 years old and I'm well aware that this was a very poor judgement call on my part. So my parents always taught me to help someone in need, just not necessarily to the extent that I allowed. Up until this point, I didn't have much of a reason not to trust people may not always have good intentions. I've also had an unreasonably difficult time saying no to people my whole life and have since had the help of a therapist to be better about it. I've only told this story to a handful of people because I truly am ashamed of my actions and potentially putting my daughter's life in danger. But here it goes. I was on my way to an event of some kind with my three-year-old daughter when I realized that I had left something behind in my apartment. I was close enough to home that I decided to turn around and head home. As I was pulling into the parking lot of my apartment complex, 
a woman was walking kind of in the middle of the driving area and began waving me down. I pulled up next to the woman and rolled down my window about a third of the way. She gave me this story of how she works at the nearby nursing home and she had run out of gas on her way to the gas station and was asking for directions to the gas station. I didn't think much of the fact that she was roaming around in my apartment complex because it was pretty common for people to cut through it as it sat between two main roads and it avoids traffic lights. So I gave her directions for a five minute walk to the gas station but she mentioned that she was pregnant and she wasn't feeling well. I tried telling her that I was in a hurry and assured her that it was a very quick walk, but she practically begged me. At this time, she noticed my daughter was in the back seat too, and she had a look of surprise that I didn't think much of it at the time, and she began talking to my daughter and made her laugh. She turned back to me and asked one last time if I could just drive her to the gas station, and at this point, I just gave in. I let her in my car, and she almost immediately asks if I have any money that she can use, my heart sank at this point, realizing that she was probably lying and just wanted to lie her way into some cash. I was honest with her and told her that I was broke and also didn't carry cash on me. She pointed out another resident in the complex and asked me to drive her to them. In my mind, there was still a slight possibility that she needed gas but didn't have the funds for it. So I drove her to the other person and she rolled down my window asking for money. They said no and she pointed out another person and at this point I told her that I really had to be somewhere and couldn't keep helping her. I drove her to the other person but far enough that she would have to get out of the car to talk with them which thankfully she did. Once she got out of the car I sped off and I drove to my destination. I told my mother about this story and a week later she sent me a clip from the local news. The news mentioned a woman would approach people asking for a simple favor which led to her asking them for money and if these people said no, she apparently pulled out a syringe or a needle of some kind and would threaten to stab them with it and did end up stabbing them on one occasion. I look at the image of the person and instantly recognize this as the woman that was in my car that day. I know these types of people don't have much of a, a conscience but I truly believe that the fact that my daughter was in the car that day is what kept that woman from stabbing me with who knows what was on or in that needle. So I thought that I would share something interesting that happened to me about 15 years ago. I know most people won't believe me, but for what it's worth, I can assure you that everything that I tell you is 100% true and how it happened to the best of my memory. However, names have obviously been changed. I was about 18 and I was hanging out at my friend Joanne's house with some other school friends. I can't quite remember how we got into the subject, but towards the end of the evening, Joanne thought that it would be fun to perform a seance. Joanne's and her family were from Cape Town, South Africa, had a deep-rooted interest in the spiritual, or at least that's what Joanne made out to us. So with the lights off and candles lit, we all sat around a table with cards found out around the edge. Each card had a letter of the alphabet arranged A to Z and a shot glass placed in the middle. Joanne starts speaking out to the spirits in Afrikaans. I remember pulling a face and rolling my eyes. It was too dark for anyone to take offense. I was an insufferable enlightened atheist teen dork. You know the type cringy 4chan edgelord who thinks any form of spirituality or religion is beneath me and my superior intellect. I never wore a fedora but I was pretty close. However, what was about to happen made me question everything. It started mundane enough. A few questions were asked and the shot glass we were resting our fingers on started to move to and fro until eventually one of my friends asked the spirit if they were associated with anyone in the room. The shot glass moved directly towards me. Incredulous, I asked the spirit, if you're associated with me, then what's my mother's maiden name? My eyes fixated on the letters that spelled out her maiden name, Jones, but the glass started spelling out something different. First, the glass went to T, then H, then O. I thought then that it was all just made up as it was completely wrong. But then, I was struck by a horrific realization when my mum was six months old, her biological father died of a heart attack and a year after that, she took her stepfather's name. 
I completely forgot this in the moment as I was expecting the glass to read out the maiden name that she had for the majority of her life, but it was actually spelling out her original maiden name of Thompson. It was a fact so trivial that I barely remembered it myself. In fact, it was something really never talked about, even within my family, as it happened so long ago. It would be really hard to believe that any of my friends would know this esoteric piece of my family's history that occurred 20 years before I was even born, but nonetheless, somehow it was being spelled out in front of my very eyes. Thompson. Mind you, my school friends and I wouldn't talk about anything deeper than video games and girls at this age. Yet, there's no way that I ever mentioned this to any of them. It's not like any of my pot-smoking loser friends had a copy of my mum's birth certificate and none of them had ever met anyone else in my family. What I'm getting at is there was just literally no way anyone could have known this. But before I could contemplate this for too long or ask any other questions to my ghostly associate, Joanne's mum came into the room and turned the light on and with a thick South African accent shouts something like, Joanne, stop messing around with this stuff and put a definitive stop to the proceedings. Of course, at the time, I played it off as a prank, but the more I think about it, the more my mind wonders. Did something actually paranormal happen that night? I know it's nothing dramatic or over the top. I didn't see an apparition or a cryptid, but unlike 90% of the other stuff that I read, this experience is actually true and something to this day that I just cannot explain. I would really love to hear your thoughts, and if you have, I don't know... Any idea as to what happened that night? When I was a kid, around six or seven, we were on a vacation at South Padre Island. It was on the Port Isabel side. We stopped at a Dollar General located at a strip mall for snacks and beach toys. I remember going through the corner of the shops towards the back. It was only maybe a few seconds, 30 seconds to a minute tops just sort of wandered off while my family loaded up bags of snacks and drinks and I distinctively remember that it was a brown colored van with sliding doors. The van pulls up in front of me and opens the sliding door. I remember at least three figures, two of the men, one driving, one opens the sliding door. In English, well, my family is Spanish speaking but I spoke English at the time already. One of them, I can't remember which one, said something along the lines of Hey kid, your mama's looking for you. We can take you to her. Come on, we're going to take you to your family. They're looking for you. A tiny bit of me was like, oh, maybe my mom is looking for me because she was always super extra and would freak out if I wasn't around her. And for a minute, I believed that she might indeed be looking for me. But then I put two and two together. My mom doesn't even speak English and these guys came by super quick. I've only been gone for about maybe a minute they came the wrong way from where my family is. A creepy van and all that and yeah, these guys want to kidnap me. So I turned and I quickly ran back to my family. And after that, I never saw the brown van again. And I know it sounds weird, but I never spoke a word about this up until, well, this moment. If there is a lesson in this, I guess it's to keep your loved ones close, especially if they're young. Always keep them around you and this all took place in maybe a window of one minute so it can happen quickly. Be careful out there. So last night I was outside at around 9.30pm digging up some mushrooms that I didn't know much about so that the wild rabbits in the area wouldn't eat them since they were near where we threw some food scraps. I didn't have a flashlight or anything because the streetlights were just bright enough that I could make out what I was doing. I looked up because I heard a noise and right now I don't even remember what the noise was but all I know is that my eyes made out what looked like a, a really terrible flip note studio animation of a stick figure with no head. It just went up in a straight line and ended and it was booking it across my street. It looked like height-wise it was exactly half of the height of the closest street lamp which was mounted to a standard electric pole. And you know when you're staring at a bright light source for a while and then when you look away or blink you sort of see the outline of that kind of light or imprinted on your eyes or whatever it is for a bit. Like whatever shape the light was is dark and then it has a sort of fuzzy grey haze around it. 
Well, this is exactly what this stupid stick thing looked like. Dark with the hazy grey outline. Except it was moving. It was over so fast and I even blinked a few times to try and see it again because I genuinely thought that it was just that effect in my eyes but I hadn't been using any flashlights and the streetlight has a, a round cloudy cover around the bulb so I couldn't have seen the light bulb itself in any way. I'm still not incredibly sure that this wasn't my eyes playing tricks on me. In fact, I'm really only like maybe 60% sure that it was real but I was sharing this because I want to see if anybody else has seen something similar. At least in the moment, it was really scary to me and I was completely convinced that I'd seen it, that I literally started crying back inside. I'm possibly being overdramatic, I know. I just have no explanation for what this was and to be honest, I really do think that I saw something that night. So my brother was telling me a story about our sister and how one time he had been crying in the bathtub when he heard footsteps and our sister came into the bathroom with him. She walked in with her head down and then put both hands on the bathroom vanity and just looked into the mirror and asked him why he was crying, never looking at him and just staring into the mirror. He climbed out of the bathtub and he went into his room and he never really thought about it again until he went to lunch with my sister and he asked her if she remembered that day and explained why he was in the bathtub crying. After he finished the story, my sister was extremely puzzled and said that she doesn't remember it at all. He was about six years old at the time, which made my sister at the time 12. So for him to remember it so clearly and her not to remember it was really weird to him. And after he shared the story with me, it brought up a weird memory with her as well. In the same house that this happened to him, there had always been weird things about it. Things being moved in front of me and weird feelings really, but this almost shared experience took the cake. So... I lived in the back room of the upstairs in our house and along with the hallway were three other bedrooms but the room in the front of our stairway was my two younger sisters bedroom. I was painting in my room because the upstairs was finally quiet with everybody else playing outside when all of a sudden I hear someone running up the stairs so I went to see who it was. When I opened the door and saw my older sister run into our younger sister's bedroom but she was wearing my favorite shirt. I immediately got upset and went into the room to yell at her, but as soon as I yelled her name, nobody was there. I called her name again and told her that it wasn't funny and I wanted to take off my shirt. I looked under the beds, the closet, I ripped off the covers, but still, nobody was there. Feeling uneasy, I went downstairs to see everyone, and my mum was the only one in the kitchen, and I asked her where my older sister was only to find out that she was down the street at my friend's house and had been gone for the last few hours. When my brother and I shared these stories, we were both immediately creeped out by the fact that we had both seen the same sister in completely different situations, but she was actually not there at all. We both felt the house was off a bit, but hadn't thought much about it until these scenarios happened to come out at a seemingly random time. As for our other siblings, well, we're not really sure if any of them had seen or heard anything either, as we're all a bit estranged and it'd be weird to just hit everyone up and ask if our old house was haunted. Another unusual thing is, although we're both 20 plus now and have moved several times to different states, when we both dream of a house in our dreams, it's always in that house. Sometimes the features of the home are slightly changed, but... As we move through the dream, we're able to identify it's the same house that we grew up in as kids. I've heard various paranormal reasonings as to how we could have seen her and when it wasn't her and all that, but never anything that felt, I don't know, concrete I guess you could say. For a bit of context, I work at a gas station in the backwoods of Tennessee and that's where this happened. Last night when I clocked in at the store, it was 8 o'clock, it was completely dead. I figured that it was going to be a pretty easy night because the road this station is on is not the main road. Actually, it used to be up until about a decade ago when a new freeway was built. 
this led basically every business that was here to pack up and leave their old building abandoned. Thanks to this, there are a lot of abandoned buildings on this stretch of road that local druggies tend to claim as their own. Anyways, at around 11, I only had an hour left of my shift and so I figured that I should actually get some work done instead of just sitting around and doing nothing. I'm 18 and so I work the shift alone, which is nice because it means I can, well, do pretty much whatever I want. This is normally pretty great because I can do whatever I want as long as I get the work done by the end of my shift. I noticed that we were almost out of barbecue chips and so I need to go get some from our storage space, which is for some reason in the basement of the station. I've always hated going down there, just because it gives me the creeps. Why the owner decided to store everything down there is beyond my comprehension, but anyway, I got about halfway down the steps before something fell on the other side of the room and it sounded like footsteps were coming my way. I sprinted up the stairs and locked the door to the basement, panicking like a madman the entire time. But when I got back upstairs, I went behind the counter to the store computer so that I could check the security cameras. I flicked over to the one that looks into the basement, and there was this guy, just standing there, smiling up at the camera. He had a, a look I can only describe as absolute insanity in his eyes, but he didn't look like the average junkie in the area. He was actually clean shaven and dressed in what looked like to be jeans and a button up of some kind. Honestly, if he had walked into the store, I wouldn't have batted an eye, but because he was down there and because he was just looking at the camera and smiling, it shook me to the core. I called the store owner and at first he was pretty mad that I called him in the middle of the night, but once he heard how freaked out I was, his tone changed. He told me that he'd be there in 15 minutes and to just lock the main door to the store and make sure the man didn't go anywhere. I asked if I should call the police, but for some reason he didn't want me to do that just yet. So I locked the entrance to the gas station and went back to looking at the man. He was still there, just smiling. About three or so minutes of him staring at me later, and finally he walked away from the camera, out of view. My boss showed up soon after, armed with a shotgun, and when I let him in, he immediately went to the basement. I went with him just because I felt safe with him being there, like another person is there and all, but we didn't find anything. My boss at first chalked this up to me being tired and hallucinating the man, but I knew what I saw. It scared me a lot and, well, first off I'd like to say that my shift yesterday went pretty normal and I have the night off tonight, which is always great. I'm mainly sharing this because, well, there are some questions obviously that a lot of people might have. First, I'll say that the owner, aka my boss, isn't exactly a model citizen. I don't think he's hiding anything illegal in the basement, but then again, I've also never really went looking for anything, so who knows. My boss is also a bit of a, well, an idiot when it comes to phones, which is why he didn't get the picture or video of the monitor. His rule is that your phone has to stay in a small drawer behind the counter for your full shift. The first time you're caught with it out, you get a warning, and the second time you get fired. I've already been caught with it once, and I really don't like being unemployed, so yeah, there were no pictures on my phone. But, eventually my boss did end up looking at the footage, and yeah, the guy was there, and he saw him. He agreed with me that it was creepy, and also apologized for saying that I just hallucinated it. He still doesn't want to call the cops for some reason, but he did say that if it happened again, he would get the police involved. He went back and looked at everything that was captured until that point, and there just were no signs of anyone going down there. Apparently, he asked the other people that work here if they'd seen anything down there, but I don't know what they said. I still don't know what to think about this whole event, but I do have another shift soon, and to be honest, I'm sort of dreading it. I used to work in an office where there were mostly guys. A lot of times guys misinterpreted me being friendly with something else, therefore I tend to not even be friendly, especially with newcomers. I really didn't engage in office chat or gossip with anyone. That week there was a new employee though, he wasn't on my team so I didn't even notice until three days later when he approached me to introduce himself and tried to talk to me all day even when our spots were very far apart and I told him a few times that I was pretty busy. I assumed that we had different lunch times since I hadn't seen him during my lunch before 
so I thought that it was odd that he was having lunch at the same time as me the next day. I found myself with him alone at one point, so I started to pick up my things and leave. When out of nowhere he said, I know girls like you play hard to get, but I really think you're beautiful, so how about we get a hotel room after work tomorrow? My girlfriend is going to dinner, so I'm free. We wouldn't do anything you don't want to, of course. We would just hang out. At first I thought it was a joke. It really did sound like a joke, to be honest. I didn't laugh, but asked him what the heck and if he was serious, and he said, Yeah, why do you think I would ever be interested in you? The fact that you just mentioned a girlfriend surprised me. How is she even attracted to you? He was an attractive man, actually, so I wasn't insulting his looks, but there was some smugness or attitude about him that was really ugly. He got really serious, though, stood up, walked away not saying anything. His schedule ended an hour before mine, and as soon as he left, other co-workers approached me worried, telling me that he'd been saying some disturbing things, like he knew people who could stab me, or how he could convince his girlfriend to do it if he told her the right things. I should be taught a lesson for being so disrespectful. I honestly freaked out and went straight to HR, and they told me that he would be spoken to. The thing that he kept repeating over and over to everyone who heard him, though, was how disrespectful I'd been. When confronted by HR the next day, he quit on the spot. They told me that he blamed me for losing his job, making more threats against me. After that, I never did see him again. He didn't try to contact me again either, which I'm thankful for. Unfortunately, though, I couldn't file any police reports since it had all been, well, just words. So this happened about five months back when I worked at this local fast food place. I shared my car with my boyfriend and we were both working this one night. I got off at 10pm and he got off at 11pm so he had the car. I didn't mind waiting on him as I'd done it many times before this. When it hit 10, I sat outside of my workplace's front door on the sidewalk. I had an hour to kill so I talked on the phone with my aunt while I waited. I'd been sitting there for probably about 45 minutes so it was almost time for my boyfriend to be getting off work and pick me up. I'm always very aware of my surroundings no matter where I am or what I'm doing. When I heard a car pull into the parking lot from the back entrance, it went around the whole building and then stopped right in front of me. It was a brown minivan with those sliding doors and it had extremely tinted windows. I mean, I don't know how to measure the window tints, but that had to be the darkest tint that you could get them at. Anyways, this man rolled down his driver's window and held out a piece of paper to me. He was about 10 or 15 feet away as I was still sitting on the curb on the phone, still with my aunt. He started saying, come here and read this over and over again. He had a, a thick accent, plus I was very confused, so I asked, do you need me to get my manager? I'm not sure what you need. His response was, no, 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 over and over again, and then you come here, very demandingly. I looked at the sliding van door, and I could see, though, that it was partially open, like sort of cracked open. I couldn't tell if anyone else was in the car because of the tinted windows, so my response was, I'll go get my manager for you. We always locked the front door because our lobby is closed at night, so I started knocking fastly on the door while not keeping my eye off the man in the van. Finally, my manager came up to the door and right when she was opening it, the driver saw her and spun his wheels and sped off, not stopping at the end of the parking lot or stop signs. I waited until the next day to call the cops because I was shaken up about it and didn't know how to explain or react initially. It seemed so obvious what he was trying to do and my manager pointed out that he probably thought that I was younger since my stature is kind of small and short. I'm just glad to have had the common sense to maintain distance and am always aware of my surroundings. I encourage everyone else to do the same because this night could have gone a lot worse. So I grew up in a home for 21 years and I'm pretty sure that it was haunted. Many unexplainable phenomena such as footsteps from something other than the living, phantom smells, objects being thrown and items disappearing completely 
They were never found even after gutting the place before moving. It happened there all the time. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal since I was a little girl. I even truly believe that I've had evil entities enter my dreams. I had a truly evil and disturbingly gory one when I was only seven years old, before I was even allowed to be influenced with such things like violent movies and TV. And well, a couple of years ago I moved to a basement apartment complex. If you follow paranormal stuff, you'll know that basements are notorious for activity. But since I moved here, I've had something like poltergeist activity that I've seen with my own eyes and I've been woken up to an unknown female voice saying hey directly in my ear that was so clear that it sounded like a living person. It even caused a breeze on my face from the breath behind the voice. I've also seen orbs with both of my own eyes and with my phone camera that my cat has seen at the same time as well. My bedroom door has been knocked on more than one occasion and woken me up from sleep. I had another dream recently after moving here that I believe was paranormal. I was not myself in the dream. I was not even the same ethnicity or age as myself and it was beyond vivid as I experienced this person's death at the end of a handgun. I'm living in a very bad neighborhood at the moment so that kind of death is not uncommon here. Only a week ago I was physically what felt like burned and it actually left a mark that stayed for hours. I've also smelled not only unfamiliar perfume here but also like a, a rancid rotten egg smell which was not an odor encountered at my last place of residence. Sometimes I wake up with pretty bad bruises that were not there when I went to sleep. Last year I almost drowned and since then my sensitivity to the paranormal I've noticed is stronger than ever. Almost I feel bordering on me being a medium or something. I should also add that while I lived here, a person died on the property in the parking lot outside my unit. That is just one death that I know of. I don't know if there were others before I moved in, but honestly, I'm feeling the presence of several things here. Every night it feels like dozens of eyes are on me, and it's unnerving to say the least. The point of this, though, is that I'm really kind of at the end of my rope. I can't sleep at night because of being afraid of all of this, and... I keep being woken up or something enters my dreams and gives me nightmares or something's harming me while I'm sleeping and I'm new to all of this and maybe someone can direct me somewhere to get some help or something. Also, any advice on how I can spiritually protect myself from whatever this is, I would love to hear it. I've tried prayer and it hasn't worked. I've tried a few other things but so far nothing has worked. This is something that happened to me a couple of years back that still freaks me out when I think about it. To start, this was around maybe midnight and I was in my room browsing stuff on my phone when I suddenly hear what sounds like knocking outside of my bedroom window, ground level. I first shrugged it off as being a squirrel or something until I heard the same sounds again which is when I started becoming a bit concerned. It was at this point that I left my room and called my dad to tell him about what was happening. He tried to reassure me that it was nothing and while it was happening, I heard even more knocking coming from around the front door. I tried calling out to see if it was my brother or anything, but it didn't get any answers. At this point, I was starting to really freak out. It was after this too that I heard someone at my back door trying to force the door open. It was locked, thankfully. And finally after this my dog finally caught on and started barking like crazy at the other end of the door which finally drove whoever was out there off. After that happened I called my grandpa who lived a block over to come and pick me up because I was way too scared to be able to stay the night in that house. In retrospect I should have called the police but I wasn't thinking straight and was shivering on the couch holding a kitchen knife the whole time that I was waiting. I still have no idea who was out there that night. I had taken a walk alone in a nature trail earlier that day and my only working theory is that someone had followed me home or something. I later learned too that there were drifters living in the woods around that area which adds to that. I have no experience of that though so that's just hearsay but this was definitely one of the scariest things that I've been through and it still makes it hard for me to stay home alone 
at night. Two years ago I moved to the UK for university as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me. In the first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with, and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in the first year was pretty difficult. Also, I should note too that I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a, a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I'm a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put, and this is where you would put your bins and broken chairs and blah blah blah. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard, but since it was an old door, we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. So, I had neighbours on each side of the house. We were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbours on the right side of us were five boys, who looked way over the age of being in university, mind you. But they were strange, so to say, as well. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him apparently and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them being covered in blood and cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by this alleged kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so... We offered him our help to clean himself up and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes in. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't really know anything more about the story. The police didn't really tell us anything else and neither did the guys. All I can say is that in the end everyone seemed to be okay apart from a few, well, cuts and bruises and whatnot. Anyway... The guy who we helped was quite weird to say the least. He said a lot of stuff and kept trying to grab me and was flirting with me and we noticed when helping him that he smoked quite a lot of weed but just didn't really care at that moment as we just wanted to make sure that he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed I would go to uni and come back home and would see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But one day he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't really respond to him in the end. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. No need to say that I was creeped out a bit and just thought that he was joking so I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. At this I panicked a bit and went back next to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away but obviously he wasn't home and nobody else was either so I literally just waited it out until they left maybe an hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note too that my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. So after this already pretty weird encounter, I just tried to avoid this guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open and the strings that we put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think much of it and I just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking that it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back or something. The weird neighbours would often scream a lot and yell and fight in their house and it would wake me up and my flatmates up in the middle of the night sometimes but we kind of got used to it after a while I guess. But one evening my boyfriend slept over like he usually did and he, who usually never wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. And suddenly, 
we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside. So at that, we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside. And then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get the heck out of that room and lock them in if they came in from the window. But then we heard my window move and open. And we also heard one of the guys saying something in a different language that we didn't understand and started to hear them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then I called the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember much after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were just in shock I guess, but they ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking some weed. And the police told us that they apparently went inside of their house and they found a lot of meth and heroin and that they were just carrying a massive kitchen knife with them as well. I was really confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors. So the idea of them breaking in with who knows what intentions with a kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend for some time. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police and I moved back home a few months later as I was just too scared and it tormented me for months on end not knowing what would happen if my boyfriend didn't wake up with me that night. I'm now still coping with it and finding it really tough to get over it. I guess I'm always just asking myself, what if? What would have happened if... I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and I get horrible nightmares because of it. But hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend and in one piece. And we often talk about it and that helps a lot too. I'm thankful for my boyfriend. This attempted abduction happened during the winter in a university town in the middle of a weekday near the Rocky Mountains. The year was 1989 or 1990. I had just completed my associate's degree and had returned to my parents' home. I was about 20 and I'm female. Both my parents and my two sisters who lived at home were at school or work. I had a few dollars and decided to walk to a grocery store that was three or four blocks away. So... My shopping went smoothly and I checked out and as I left the checkout stand I saw two men enter the store. The men were dressed appropriately for the weather. Both were six feet tall at least, maybe as tall as six two and dark haired. They were similar in build and ethnicity by the looks of it. They could have been related in fact. Nothing was really remarkable about them but their behavior was just off from the get-go. They had walked in and then stood between the main entrance and the checkout stands looking around. They had not headed straight to the aisles to shop or anything. Then one of them noticed me and he stared at me and smacked the other guy lightly and directed him to see me. I felt as if I'd been lit up by a spotlight and I've never been the kind of gal men notice. I was overweight then, still am and I don't think that I'm that pretty. But when I saw this I almost went looking for a security guard but... I ended up wishing that I had, to be honest. I decided that I was being paranoid. I gave the two men a wide berth and, ignoring my instincts and the two men, I left the store. As I crossed the wide parking lot, I saw an older model car pull out of the parking lot, going the same direction as myself. The car was distinctive. I'm not good at identifying cars, but this one was a two-tone vehicle, dark blue and cream, that looked like it was from the 1970s. To get home, I had to cross a busier road, then walk down a very quiet residential road for at least two blocks, before turning a corner and walking about half a block to our small apartment complex. I happened to know most of our neighbors on that quiet street, or at least knew them enough to know most of the residents would not be home during the day. I had barely started down the first residential block, when the same 1970s car came towards me down that block. The two men from the store were inside, and... They stared at me as they drove slowly by. At this point, I was sure that I wouldn't make it to our apartment building before they tried to get me. 
I was looking at each home trying to remember if any of them were retired or stay-at-home parents or something, but I couldn't be certain if anyone would be home. As the car came up behind me, driving very, very slowly, I got my keys out and began to jangle them to find my house key. The car pulled to the curb just ahead of me and that was where my heart sank because the passenger door opened and I acted as if I couldn't see them and headed up the nearest walkway to the closest house. I acted as if I was arriving home. I got to the porch, put down my bag and went to put my key in the lock. A lock it wouldn't fit in obviously. I was turned just enough to see them and the passenger stayed in the car, then closed the door and they immediately sped away. At this, I ran as fast as I could to our apartment, and in the end I didn't call the police because really all I had was evidence of a strange story. I was paranoid for days about going anywhere alone. I told my parents, and I think my dad took me more seriously than my mum, but anyway, it was definitely a, a weird experience, and I do think that there was something going on there, and that they were attempting to either kidnap me, mug me, or something, who knows. I'm just thankful that I never had to find out. I've been staying at my aunt's house for a week or so while they're on retreat with each other and all was well for the first six days and then I find that the back gate is wide open. That wouldn't really worry me for one but to access that gate in particular you have to go past a six foot tall sliding gate. The house is right off the road downtown, so the driveway is on the side of the house and the garage is basically in the backyard. But once you go into the big sliding gate, you pull up right in front of the garage and next to the house. To get to the back door and go inside, there are two side gates that go off to the back area. One gate leads to the backyard and the other leads to the back door. Now, I have not touched the one that leads to the backyard the whole time that I've been there. And well, I worked the night shift and I arrived home at 11.30. I got home. I know for a fact that the gate was not open when I left because my dog was trying to get out of that gate and I told her no and to come to the gate that I was using. I got home and, well, it was about 2am when the dog starts fussing and I was like, I guess they might have to go potty. So I walked outside and the dog starts barking like crazy. No big deal, I mean, they do it every time they go out pretty much, but then I look to my left and see that the second gate was wide open. At that, my heart sank because I knew that I didn't open that gate, and it was closed when I returned home not even three hours ago. I called my parents and told them the situation, and they're not that concerned. I checked the entire house, all the closets, under the bed, and nobody is in the house and nothing looks awry though I am jumping at every sound their cat and two dogs make. I'm scared and I want to leave, but also scared to return outside to my car. I have very high anxiety and panic attacks, and I'm feeling one coming on, so I know all the doors are locked, though none of their windows have curtains, so anyone outside can easily see inside. But I need some reassurance, so I sit back in my room with all the dogs around me, and, long story short, I packed all my stuff up and I was just sitting on the couch with the dogs when I noticed police lights outside of the house in front of the next door neighbor's house. I walk outside with all of my stuff locking the front door of the house. I went over to the cops and asked them to escort me to my car because I felt unsafe. And it turns out the cops are there at the neighbor's house due to reported suspicious activity. Three men escorted me to my car and I got the heck out of Dodge. My gut was telling me that something wasn't right that night and obviously something was not right because cops were at the next door neighbor's house. I'm now safe and I got off the phone with my brother and I'm almost home but something was going on there that night and I just felt like I was being watched. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon and around 9.30 or 10 at night, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. But we sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But towards the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. 
We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before and I understand that when you talk about things like this, it puts you in a very specific type of headspace. All night I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. So... We started walking back to camp and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road you see the entrance to the campsite and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front and I don't believe the doors and the windows are shuttered but they're definitely not accessible. Like, I wouldn't be able to press my face against a window and try to peek in. It's that kind of boarded up. So, I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes and we were talking about his story and I was trying to debunk it and figure out with him when all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both really didn't think too much of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl, she walks up to the abandoned building and looks as if she's peering into the window or trying to open the door on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tippy toes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. And this is when I start to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us or even though we're loudly standing there talking and the way that she was walking, all I could see was like her side or back profile in a sort of long brown ponytail. I know this doesn't make much sense, but it's like how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair and... It's not like she had her head turned, if that makes sense. Anyway, she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come out. At this point, I'm actually invested and am grilling the location she went to the whole time and don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there and was waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge on the side of the building that looks maybe, I don't know, three or four inches wide. Kind of like a gutter hanging off, I guess. And I swear on my life that it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was frozen and just watching us. Shane has his spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight and he shined it on the little edge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge and... It made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and screamed, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where he thought that she would pop out. And after a delayed four or five seconds, we literally saw her sprinting out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back haunched over, so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would. And I cannot explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place and once we shine the flashlight, we have this person's face pop out from the side of the building. It legit would have been less scary if she never came out and we circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural and it was as if no human being would respond with her body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It's like she couldn't figure out what to do and she showed herself only because we made her. It was almost as if she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong. Not scared of us, I guess you could say. But the way she popped out, her face turned towards us and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis arms or something. And I know that this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. But neither one of us saw a face on this woman. It was just smooth skin or sort of clay colored, rounded and with no eyes or facial expression. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We thought it was just our minds playing tricks on us or something. But this is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit so bear with me. 
After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns his flashlight off when I asked him to because I felt like it was rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off and I can see her extended body about three feet off the ground, as if she's crouching and reaching out at the same time. It was almost like she was going to take like a, an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulls herself back behind the ledge and stands up straight and starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time now and she just says, oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make sense why she needed to change in that specific spot of all places. The strange part though is that I specifically heard her talk about changing and Shane heard her say something about just having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that that's what she was doing because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left side of the building across to the right and back down the trail towards the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing too is that, again, I didn't see her face the entire time that she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time, all I saw was her long brown ponytail when I should have been able to see her face. After she slowly walked back down the road towards the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how weird that was, the whole interaction, and that we need to get back to our own site, and he told me that this person had a short blonde bob or Karen-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that she had a long brown ponytail because he hadn't seen that color anywhere on this person. And I guess that's one of the really weird things too because there's just absolutely no way that one of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. Anyway, as we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of dark trees that as a female would definitely have peed or changed behind. And it's like this building was so far out of the way and I would never think to go so distant to the right side of the building like that. Late at night as well, in order to change my clothes? It was weird. What I mean is that it just didn't make any sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in like New York, New Orleans, Denver or whatever and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we could chalk it up to the person being high and just kind of laugh it off. But this is a random quiet family campground where everybody is super happy and peaceful. Sure, we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on, but even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to her body movements, plus the smooth face that we both saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural, not when she came slinking up, not when she didn't notice us sitting there, not when she looked in the window, not when she walked across the building, not when she dipped behind the ledge, not when she peered out, not when she crouched down, not when she replied to us, and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that I had tears in my eyes and it had me shook, but I was so incredulous at the same time because I just couldn't believe it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it already happened and I just had to sit there and process that I really saw what I did. But we talked about NPCs sometimes and we joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real and we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels but this was something else entirely. This was something that seems like, I don't know, a lower form or less intelligent than us sort of being that was pretending to be a human. I know that sounds crazy and weird, but I feel like I should add too that this is a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with stories of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. But I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us, this didn't seem like something with an emotional intention, it, it didn't seem quick or cunning or like it wanted something from us. This was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. 
I have no idea what its intentions were or why it was here of all places or why it presented itself to us that night, but I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that, well, this happened. Also, I should probably mention that we aren't too sure how much this plays into it either, but we're coming from New Orleans and we're having really strange experiences there. Not like with people per se, but it felt as if sometimes the streets would shift or change. It was weird and certain places would make us feel uncomfortable or cause our emotions to be super intense. There was a graveyard and a church we ended up sleeping next to and that gave us constant nightmares and made us feel like we couldn't fall asleep and as if something was looking in our windows all night. In fact, I heard a voice in the same spot one night that foreshadowed our cat getting killed. We heard weird animalistic roars coupled with sort of a metallic banging and clanging while we were falling asleep. The wind was blowing our curtains violently around on the right side of our bus while the left side curtains were completely untouched while our blind husky, who usually sleeps all through the night, was sitting up with her ears perked up, staring at the window. It was all just getting too much to bear and we felt like the city was trying to take something from us. So we got out of there to go on vacation to this campsite on the beach and we aren't sure if we bought something along with us or not. We're trying to piece it all together, as you can obviously tell. Also, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but it was still part of our night last night. As we were walking back down the boardwalk towards the main road, we were stopped by an older woman who wanted to talk to us about her husky and ask Shane where he was from. I was busy trying to keep the dog on the trail and kind of walked a little bit faster and was going to keep continuing, not in a sort of rude way, but just not really wanting to make small talk sort of way. But she kind of made me stop and turn around and she asked me where I was from too and I told her New York. We made small talk about van lifting and whatnot and she asked our names and when I said Naomi she said, Oh my grandson's name is Noam. That's the male version of Naomi. And I told her that that was really beautiful. I, I'd never heard that before and she told us her name is Pat and I was like, Wow, that's wild. That's my mum's name, Patricia. And she said, well, you guys can call me Pat or Patricia and maybe I can come over and check out your bus tomorrow. It looks like you really did a beautiful job. We exchanged pleasantries and wish each other a good night. But when Shane and I got to the picnic table, we were just kind of spacing out and talking about how interesting of an interaction that she had the same name as my mum and I had the same name as her grandson and, and how this was a really beautiful but random coincidence. And then we thought that well, maybe it wasn't so random after all. Pat had already walked back to the campground, and this was just before the woman above came by. So this is the strangest thing that I've ever seen, and it was somewhere in West Virginia years ago. I was hiking through the woods off trail, and at some point I came across a really random field that was quite large, that was clearly someone's farm. I was about to go around it too until I noticed a bunch of people wearing what looked like cloth diapers and head wraps while burning a cross with a pig hanging from a chain. They were speaking in a language that I didn't recognize. They saw me, we both sort of had a deer in the headlights moment look for what felt like forever, but then a, a few started my way. And I have never run back up a mountain in the dark so fast for so long. I still have no clue what they were doing. I don't think that I could find that place again if I wanted to, to be honest. But what I can say is that West Virginia has some weird people in it. This was about four or five-ish years ago. And back then, I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was a part of a large piece of farmland that was split up and sold off. So we did have neighbors, though they were roughly half a kilometer away each. We loved that though because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby that I couldn't go to if I needed help too. And that thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and I just couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, I know that. 
And after this incident, I never walked after 6pm ever again, always making sure that there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. So, the route that I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed, and reception was pretty good, so I would have also been able to call someone. The second half, on the other hand, was concealed by about 200 metres of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometres at the back of the farm, and it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. So, it was late at night. I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black, with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out to the open again when I heard it. Help. It was this sort of monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my headphones out and turned my music off to make sure that I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help. Help is what it said. A very stupid part of me almost responded too because for some reason my first instinct was, oh no, someone's in trouble. Like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, then my brain kicked in and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing that I could do. So I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her back to come towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran towards her, grabbed her, then turned around and bolted back towards my house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know that I was there, and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase or anything to. I was just completely terrified that whole time. The image of someone cloaked in shadows chasing me entered my mind and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. But it doesn't end there though. You see, despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really did need help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location, another very stupid decision considering what we found, that being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody ever answered. We didn't get out of our car, obviously. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid, I guess you could say, but... We drove home having seen nothing and no one, but it still bothered me in the morning so I had my mother drive us over again and we searched the immediate area. Nothing though, no indication that anyone had even been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for I know, but I know shock can leave you eerily calm which could have explained the monotone voice and the lack of response afterwards, which made me fear that we'd been too late and that we'd find a body in the morning or something. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome to be honest because at least then I would have had a, a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, not even tracks. And to this day I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some, I guess you could say chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep. Like maybe it was a, a rapist, a kidnapper, a serial killer or something. All the classic horror stories, but I guess I'll, I'll just never really know for sure. So I know that we've all had like bad dates, right? But this, this is the only date that I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll preface this by saying that I don't really go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure that I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public areas, let either my family or friends know where I'm going, and park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested that we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks, and I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that, and I only want to meet in public. 
He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times, and I said if money is an issue that we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose, that I was familiar with and equidescent to where we both lived. So he turns up in a two-door car, this detail is relevant too, and goes into the cafe. I follow behind and introduce myself and after a polite introduction things begin to get, well, weird. You see, I order a coke and he says, don't you want to drink? I was going to pop into the bar, which is connected to the cafe, and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me with a sort of WTF look, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages that I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again got to me a bit. He seems disappointed and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway... We sat down with our drinks and my date immediately goes on about going back to his place again, even though the original plan was to stay here and order food and I already stated that that wasn't happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating at his place and I said that we don't have to eat, we can just have our drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says that he has money but prefers it if we go back to his. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer are you? And... Instead of laughing it off, he stares at me sort of uncannily and says, You don't think that I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say, Of course not, but really I'm relieved that this date won't be going any further. The date suddenly says, Are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make sense. How about we go in my car, but I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back and I'll drop you back off at your car after. In reality, that made less sense. The fact that it was completely illogical too made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point and I said, look, I don't want to go to yours and your insistence is giving me the creeps. The date looks shocked, mumbles something about needing the toilet and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. Obviously, it was a massive bullet dodge in my opinion. But as I was watching him leave, also the fact that his car didn't actually have back doors made it seem even more sinister because imagine if something did happen in the car and then you just couldn't get out. I mean, being in those back seats, there was no way out but past him. So before I begin this, I just want to say that I'm looking for some answers to what happened to me when I was around 12 to 13 years old. I'm 23 now, but these events, they still loom over me. So at the time, I was living in Virginia with my parents and two step-siblings. We had recently moved into a newly built townhouse development. Our townhouse had three floors in total. The upstairs area is where the bedrooms were located, the living room and the kitchen were on the main floor, and the basement was my sister's bedroom. At the time, I was becoming increasingly interested in the paranormal too. I would watch all sorts of ghost shows on television and eventually I learned what a Ouija board was. I wanted one too, but I knew that I wouldn't have the means to buy a real one myself, and I knew my parents would not approve too, so I opted to make my own. I created a template on a piece of cardboard, carefully replicating what a real one would look like. For the planchette, I used a plastic square-shaped lid that was the perfect size. I heard that it wasn't safe to use it by myself, and I didn't have any friends in the area at the time, so I asked my sister if she would try it with me. She was reluctant at first, but after some convincing, she was game. Her uncle had recently passed a few months prior, so we decided to try and contact him. We set the board up in the basement, her bedroom, with a picture of her uncle next to us. We both lightly put our fingers on the makeshift planchette, and I began to ask questions like, Uncle so-and-so, are you here with us tonight? To both of our surprise, too, it didn't take long to get a response. The planchette moved to yes with force. At first, I assumed that my sister was messing with me, but soon I would be proved wrong because she started crying very hard. After a few more questions with responses, my sister informed me that she wanted to stop. 
I don't really remember what else we asked because it was so long ago, but I do remember that the planchette would move with haste after every question that we asked, and we ended up informing her uncle that we were leaving and moving the piece to goodbye. Afterwards, it took some time for my sister to calm down, and I was pretty blown away myself, I'll admit. But then, strange things started happening to me almost immediately after. After we had finished using the board, we both went upstairs to calm down and watch some TV. And 30 minutes later, I heard a bang come from the basement. I went downstairs to investigate and found that the planchette had moved from goodbye to no, and a picture on the wall had fallen down. This disturbed me a bit, so afterwards I opted to tear up the board and throw it away. After I did this, I assumed that that was the end of it, and for my sister it was. I didn't know that... This was the beginning of months of pure terror for me. I don't know why, but whatever this thing was attached to me. My sister didn't have any odd occurrences afterwards, but meanwhile, I started noticing strange things happening. It started sort of small at first. I noticed our family dog would all of a sudden refuse to come into my bedroom. I would pick him up and take him into my room anyways, and when he was in there, he would act really strange. His ears would stick straight up, and his eyes would fixate on a certain corner in the room. He would whine and bark, and occasionally his head would dart around like he was watching something move around. Then, I was sitting in my room another day on my own. I was watching TV and laughing at the show that I was watching. My school blinders were sort of sitting all the way at the foot of my bed, and I was sitting at the head of the bed a good distance away, when one of the blinders slid all the way across my bed, hitting me in the arm. This freaked me out and I informed my parents, but they told me that I was just imagining things. And weird things like this kept happening to me. But one time I walked into the kitchen during the day by myself and a sponge that was sitting on the dining room table suddenly flew across the room with force. I continued to experience things like this and they started becoming more frequent, I guess you could say. I talked to my sister about it and she told me that nothing odd was happening for her. I was just a complete mess at the time though. I did not want to go home and would often try and go to a friend's house after school instead, which most of the time didn't work out. I talked to my parents again and go figure, they thought that I was making it up for attention again. After a little bit of going through it though, I had the most terrifying night of my life and this event still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. It traumatized me, and although I've worked past it for the most part, I still try not to think about it. I've only told a few people in my life about this too, because it sounds like a straight-up lie, and I know it. But this, this night was the climax of my experiences, and after this happened, the activity just completely stopped. So one night, I was lying in my bed, it was 2 or 3 in the morning and I couldn't sleep so I was just sort of laying there. My whole family was asleep and the house was completely dark. I slept with my door open at the time and the only light source was a blue light emanating from my radio in my room. It was just bright enough to illuminate my room and I had my blanket over my head covering half my face but I could still see my room from waist height down to the floor. And to my horror, as I laid there with my eyes open, a black figure entered my field of vision near the foot of my bed. It was right next to my bed too, and there was no color on whatever this was. It was a pure pitch black with no obvious features. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I just laid there as I watched this thing slowly move down my bed until it stopped right in front of my face. I then felt a hand placed on my head through the blanket that was over me. The hand rested there for a second and then began moving in a circular motion for a few seconds. Eventually the hand lifted and I watched the dark figure slowly move away and then out of the room. This was the last thing that ever happened to me. After that, like I said, it just completely stopped as fast as it started. This whole ordeal has had a huge impact on my life. This is the first time that I'm sharing this story like this with a lot of people. I haven't tried until now because I didn't want to type it out and relive it, I guess. And now I'm more curious as to what the heck happened to me and 
what that thing was. I think I should probably also add that, aside from anxiety and depression issues, I am mentally sound. I've never experienced hallucinations or delusions, not that I know of anyway, and I know that what happened to me was real. I'm sharing this not only to share my story, but to also gain insight from others. So, what do you think this could have been? Was it a demon as I've heard? Has anyone hearing this had any similar experiences? I wish that I could be more detailed, but it's been so long and I've largely tried to forget about this time of my life that it's really hard to remember everything. But if you can help me out, then thanks in advance. Four years ago, I was a sophomore in high school. I hadn't yet got my license, and this is right around the time that I started to partake. Me and one of my friends in the neighborhood, Kurt, knew of a creek about a mile and a half from my house, which would be a nice place to smoke, but it was a bit of a hike to get there. It was well known that there was a few scattered structures in the woods there too, such as a concrete hut, an old barrel fire pit, and a platform built into the trees all within a few dozen feet of each other. This is all about a quarter mile into the woods and about a half a mile from any roads. We had been there during the daytime dozens of times before, usually with more friends, but we lived in a nice suburban neighborhood so it didn't seem dangerous to us. Not to mention nobody else had ever been spotted there before. In fact, it had become a pretty common smoking spot for kids our age. We all just assumed that it was an old abandoned homeless structure, but there were still legends passed around by other high schoolers making claims of something sinister there. Hooks for hands, serial murders, inbred cannibals, typical campfire stories I guess you could say, that type of thing. Anyway, the concrete hut itself was about 7 by 7 by 5 foot, and the ground had been dug out on the inside, making the roof even taller. We had found improvised weapons, food, cans, trash there. This was all when we first discovered it two years earlier, but nothing of that nature since then. Just beer cans, roaches, and cigarette butts scattered around the fire pit from neighborhood kids. The inside was scribbled with Sharpie. The top was covered with a tarp, and the whole thing smelled terrible, so none of us dared to enter it. Like I mentioned before, there was also a lookout platform built into a tree about 50 feet away. An improvised ladder made of branches led to the 5x5 platform about 20 feet off the ground. The wood was clearly water damaged, so I had never wanted to actually go up there. Back on track though, this particular October evening, Kurt and I left at about 6pm, hoping to get there before dark. We had several other smoke spots that were closer to my house, but nothing quite matched the excitement and mystique of the hut. So we make our way through the neighborhood, through some backyards, into a field, and we finally pass through the tree line. Stones laid out across the creek allowed us to cross without getting wet. But right around the time we got there too, the sun was almost fully set, and no light was coming through the trees. This was the first time either of us had been there at night. We hiked the last 500 feet uphill, and we could just barely see the hut through the darkness. The atmosphere, though, had us both uneasy that day, and... We talked with the quietest whisper possible. We didn't want to approach the structure, so we decided to smoke about 50 feet from the hut, right on the edge of the bluff that we just climbed. I decided to shift a few feet over to more even footing before we started, and I felt my foot snag on a fishing line running about a foot off the ground, tied to the tree next to me. A loud clang was made as the line yanked an empty metal bucket into a metal scrap planted on the ground, almost like a makeshift alarm. We hear someone moving down from the platform in the tree about 20 feet away from us and drop into the leaves below. We take off down the bluff, sliding on our butts and hitting trees and we still hear scurrying and grunting behind us. We get to the bottom and sprint through the creek. I trip on a loose rock below me and fall into the freezing cold water before bolting up and continuing to run. About a second later, we hear splashes behind us. At this point, we clear the tree line and are in a quarter mile of open field. We sprint as fast as we can away. Kurt and I are hurt, out of breath, and the person is clearly catching up. We can hear them right behind us breathing heavily and their loud footsteps growing closer and closer. We sprint through someone's backyard and we hear their dog start barking. 
We finally run into the middle of the street and a car slams on their brakes. Kurt and I screech to a halt to avoid this car. We turn around to see somebody standing just outside of the floodlights of a nearby house. Before, they turn around and run away back towards the forest. We apologize to the driver, ditch the weed, and I called my sister to come and pick us up. We explained to her what happened, begged her not to tell my parents, and after that, we never returned to that creek ever again.